Oh, yay. Hello. Welcome. Um, Janelle, do you want to start welcoming everyone and asking where they're from? Yes. Hi, everyone. How are you? Thank you so much for joining us, making time for this conversation. Um, I know that there's a lot going on right now. And because of COVID, everyone's still scared. Everyone's, you know, there's a lot of information, but at the same time, there's a lot of misinformation that leads us to be fearful. But we want to highlight the fact that instead of being fearful, we have to be careful and considerate of everyone around us. And that's why um, I laud Erin for putting this together, because this is where we hope to get accurate information for participants, for Filipinos in our community as well, because as we know, and as they say, knowledge is power. And one thing we do with that knowledge once we have it is that we share it with others because we are each other's keeper. So if we know information that we that will help other people, and that's what we do is we share it with others. And that's why, that's what this afternoon is all about. It's about sharing. And so, like I said earlier, I laud and applaud Erin for starting this. Um, she has been working really hard the last few days. Erin, I don't even know if you got sleep last night or if you've been getting sleep, but Erin is a stealth startup entrepreneur fighting COVID-19 with emerging tech and works as a software engineer and computational designer, hybrid and educator. She's widely regarded as an internationally acclaimed author as lead contributor and editor of O'Reilly Media's Creating Augmented and Virtual Realities and as the founder of the national nonprofit organization organization faster, Philippine ex Americans in STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, where she leads and serves as national board president, being very busy organizing this FasterCon event. Erin, go ahead um, with your formal welcome remarks to everyone. Hi, Mabuhay. Welcome, everyone that's watching. Um, I know that we have, I think, RSU pieces from the Philippines and Canada. Um, FAST is primarily focused in the US, but we always have folks from all around. Uh, I am mean, going to share my screen, and so I'm just going to pause really quick. So um, folks in the Zoom chat, you can holler at me if you can see the screen. You can see my face at the same time. There are no audio issues. And someone, I think on both on Facebook, um, Aldrin, if you want to check the folks here and see me, and in Zoom yeah. in the chat. OK, great. Thanks. Um, so welcome to uh, FasterCon Day 2. Um, FASTER stands for Philippine X Americans in Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics. Uh, we started in 2015 and we're the only uh, national 501c3 uh, nonpartisan nonprofit organization really dedicated to diversity, equity, inclusion, um, really focused just on Philippine X Americans here in the United States as a part of the tech ecosystem. Uh, when I say only multi-stakeholder um, sort of organization and entity, it means we include uh, academia, industry, from students, employees, investors, entrepreneurs. Um, if you want to be in STEAM or the tech industry, uh, this community is for you. Um, so in celebrating Philippine X American History Month, we're ending the month of October. Um, please use the hashtags, uh, hashtags FasterCon20 um, and FAM, which stands for Philippine X American History Month. Um, we've had a number of events throughout the entire month. Uh, so early on was, a, I think we started non-Filipino time early in uh, September. And tomorrow we'll have our Arts Day um, for all of the different folks who don't know. Um, faster, when we, we emphasize the A in STEAM, we're really highlighting and celebrating um, our leaders that con contribute to technology at the intersection of arts, design, entertainment, games, and social media. Uh, there's actually quite a few leaders there. Um, Bobby Rubio, who is a director and story artist at Pixar, uh, will be featuring his short um, called Floats um, tomorrow, as well as a live Q&A. And we have an ensemble uh, set of panelists from Facebook, companies like Netflix, et cetera, that will be talking. Uh, and then we'll have breakouts um, for each of the faster components uh, for students, for professionals, and entrepreneurs over the course of this weekend on Saturday and Sunday. Um, so welcome to our event. Um, this is the first uh, event that I've seen really focused on uh, science and technology and how our community is contributing um, to the fight of COVID-19. So uh, here we highlight so many amazing folks, um, elected officials, congressional candidates, um, esteemed uh, researchers, um, 
multiple um, doctors, so pediatrician and physicians, uh, health and safety experts, uh, engineers like myself. And yeah, we're all fighting COVID-19. As you know, Filipino Americans are um, very much impacted by um, the global pandemic. It's not uh, just because a lot of us are related to Filipino nurses on um, the essential workers and healthcare you know, system. Uh, we're everywhere really uh, as a part of this fight. And, and it's really important whether we're helping develop a vaccine, whether we're organizing, um, thinking about you know, every essential worker that isn't just um, you know, at a hospital, but if they're driving a car, if they are, you know, at the grocery store, if they're in social work, we are such an important part um, of this fight. And it's really important to really talk about the folks um, behind the scenes that are working on preventative measures that are keeping our community safe. Um, so this panel really is dedicated um, to you all, and we have very diverse background of folks here. Um, so today I'm just going to give a very quick overview of FASTER. Uh, we'll have uh, Janelle So, who is our MC today, um, intro the amazing uh, Yobi Benjamin, who was our keynote speaker in 2016, talk about his work on test kits. Um, we'll have a brief chat with the Honorable Vice Mayor, Jocelyn Manalo, who I'm proud to call a friend, um, and my very good friend, Julian Chung, uh, who is also formerly at Oculus, talk about 3D printed PPE. Uh, later on, we'll have um, a transition over into our panels on biotech and health tech, uh, esteemed uh, Professor Romer, as well as um, Kim, Kimberly Carlson uh, at Asserter Corporation uh, talk about COVID-19 data. And then we'll have our amazing civic tech leaders, Jennifer Zimmerman is a congressional candidate out of Florida, as well as um, Liz Altenglo, a good friend of mine who is the Philpro Filipino Young Leaders Program um, COVID-19 Task Force Chair and ending with Charity Nicolas, who I'm proud to be on our board is a health and tech, uh, safety uh, expert that is in charge of a lot of the reopening at tech companies. Um, and with that being said, I'm gonna hand back the mic over to Janelle uh, to introduce uh, Yobi Benjamin. Yay, hi Erin again. Thank you so much for that. Also, I'd like to say hi to everyone that are joining us on our Facebook page at So Janelle. We're sharing this from the faster um, uh, uh, page, Facebook page as well. I realize that the MC introduces everyone but never gets to introduce themselves. So if you will allow me just 60 seconds or even 30 seconds. Uh, my name is Janelle So Perkins. I founded, started, hosted and produced the first and only daily talk show for Filipinos in the US. I did that on LA 18, which is a local network here in Southern California from 2006 to 2014, where I took a break to start a family. And in 2017, I uh, launched my new weekly talk show that is the only Filipino show that airs on three channels, the Filipino Channel Lifestyle Network and uh, KSCI TV LA 18 as well. So please catch, please catch us there. We aim to give accurate news and information, especially during this time. Also uh, culturally relevant stories, stories that reflect our heart and our soul as Filipino American community, as well as helpful tools for our Kababayans in order to be able to cope despite everything that's going on in our world right now. And it is through this show that I'm meeting a lot of inspiring individuals also, thank you to Erin for introducing me to some of them. Because of you, I am meeting a lot of these Filipinos doing amazing things in the field of STEAM. And one such is Yobi Benjamin. I have the honor of introducing him tonight. He is a venture, invest, venture investor and innovator in autonomous mobility, AI, advanced materials, life sciences, fintech, telecom, cannabis technologies, sustainability, and retail consumer products. In recognition of his technology achievements in virtual reality, the World Economic Forum named him as 2015 technology pioneer. Mr. Benjamin is an active member of the World Economic Forum's expert network Work, and I am so honored to introduce him to you. Uh, go ahead, uh, Benjamin, and um, oh, Yobi, go ahead and uh, give us your opening remarks. Well, first of all, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's very unusual to be on Zoom doing this because, as Aaron said, four years ago I did this live over in UC Berkeley, and uh, it doesn't change. It, but however, this, this medium doesn't change one thing. I'm really privileged to be amongst all of you. Um, I have to say, 
um, in the field of tech, and everybody here who's around here knows this, right? There's not a lot of us in the field of tech. Um, and, um, but, you know, Aaron puts out this show that gives um, not only myself, but others an opportunity to meet each other. We have a small circle, but I think we have the potential of creating a very strong circle of friends and colleagues and, you know, uh, have the ability to help each other. I came, um, I graduated from the University of the Philippines uh, in 1980, 1983. I left the Philippines actually in 1980. The reason why I graduated 1983 is of my thesis that was held back for three years. <laughs> but, so I officially graduated 83, although I came to the US in uh, 1980. Uh, I started uh, a small company uh, company here. Well, I, I should say, I should correct myself. I joined a, a small company here at that time and had the opportunity to um, do some really interesting work. That company is Lotus Development Corporation, where we basically worked on what's known as the spreadsheet. Uh, as you know, the spreadsheet is now all over the planet. Uh, Lotus, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've done a bunch of things. I was the global CTO, chief technology officer of Citibank. I was a senior partner at Ernst & Young. Uh, and right now I am a partner at a company called PA Consulting, a British firm. Um, our market cap's about a couple billion, uh, annual sales about 650 uh, million British pounds. Again, thank you very much for inviting me. This is such an honor to be with all of you. Thank you, uh, Yobi. It is our honor to, and we're all so excited to hear what you have to say. Before that, let me start uh, our fireside chat with this video. Did you have a screen share? Oh, you want a screen share? Um, yes, yes, I yeah. am. I am doing a screen share now. It's just not like, there you go. Yeah. It's very difficult to defeat this virus because you don't know who's carrying the virus. It's not like SARS. It's not like Ebola. The virus continues to live and is transmissible even by asymptomatic people. People should be tested regularly and they should be tested up until the time that they, we find uh, a vaccine. It really changes the way society operates and how we interact with others. Uh, but we have no choice. We have to just live with the reality and the science of this virus. This is not a political discussion. This is about science, this is about biology, this is about a virus. And we should react to this virus on the basis of sound science and facts and also a compassion for others. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Yobi, for leading this way, talking to us this afternoon or this evening about what you are doing, what your folks are doing, your company's doing in terms of testing. So I guess uh, we also would like to uh, invite everyone to type in their questions in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that. Um, this is a free flowing conversation, so you don't have to wait. Uh, if, you, if, you, if something comes up, if a question comes up, just type it in and, and I will be reading that out to Yobi. So Yobi, I guess the first question for me is, um, explain to us the three types of COVID testing that's available right now. Um, it, this is really important for people to understand uh, the three types of tests that are available. Uh, this is a very short explanation, but it will give you information so that you can decide what tests you're going to go for. So the first type of test that you are going to hear about a lot is called the PCR test. Uh, the PCR test is called a polymerase, right, chain reaction test. I'm not going to go and explain what it does, but the short end, the short thing is it amplifies uh, it amplifies your RNA so that we can identify the DNA of the virus. Basically, uh, it is extremely accurate, and uh, my colleagues here. Um, 
Romer, Amb Arbian, they're all going to tell you how extremely accurate it is. Um, it's also the one that is the most widely used. Uh, the second one is called the antigen test. The antigen test is uh, used is, is different from the PCR test, although uh, the way you get the virus sample is pretty much the same. You take a nose swab or a throat swab, and then you test it. By the way, antigen tests are call, also called rapid tests, uh, which is a misnomer because uh, uh, yet they are fast, uh, but they also have a tendency to be not so accurate. Uh, so you sacrifice, you basically sacrifice uh, accuracy for speed. If you get a positive, by the way, with a uh, with a um, antigen test, it's likely you're positive. But uh, the protocol is that you have to follow on with a PCR test to make sure there are a lot of false negatives that can occur in a uh, antigen test. And the third one, which is actually the least interesting one, is an antibody test. An antibody test requires you to draw blood usually a pinprick similar to what you do when, if you have diabetes or, you know, it's just a very simple pinprick. And it looks for, um, it looks for um, antibodies. The, the only problem with this is antibodies only show up after you have developed antibodies to the virus. So it's basically an indicator of whether you have had the virus uh, early or still have an active infection. Uh, if it's early, it, it will trigger a certain type of uh, a signal and it's late, it triggers a different type of signal. So overall, I will, uh, just to summarize this, I will tell you that I would recommend that people take a PCR test rather than any of these other tests uh, because it's just simply the most accurate one. And by the way, last point, the CARES Act, uh, which was passed by Congress, uh, guarantees that everybody gets a free test. You don't have to pay for it, okay? So this is in the law. So if you need a test, go get it. Myself. Okay, yes. Thank you for that, uh, Yobi. I, I'm getting questions here from Charity. What's the most accurate? I think you already mentioned that PCR. There's a question from Erin. Uh, what tests are known to have false positives? A lot of tests, uh, of the antigen, the antibody, uh, the antigen test can have a false negative, right? Um, right? But if they test positive in that, they're most likely, they most likely are positive with COVID. But can you clarify the statement for us? Not all tests are created equal. Yeah, well, that's exactly the point. I mean, these three tests all have different sensitivity to the detection of the virus. Um, you know, the PCR test, actually in terms of how long it takes to find, to identify the virus, in a PCR test and an antigen test, the actual time is the same. You know, it's about an hour and a half for a PCR test. And it's about anywhere from 15 minutes to 30 minutes for an antigen test. It almost doesn't matter. The reason why PCR tests take much longer has nothing to do with the actual test. It's the supply chain. It's getting from the collection point and it has to be moved to the lab. And then from the lab, it, go, it has to go into a queue and because it's the most popular test, uh, there is a big backlog. That's the only reason why it takes long to do a PCR test. But a PCR test, once you start it in the machine, the PCR machine, it'll take an hour and a half and you'll get it. It's not that long. It's the supply chain that's the problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's still the most accurate uh, test. And I'm sure my friend, my doctor friends here, Romer, can opine on this a little later. Uh, and the other thing too is an antigen test, if it's positive, the CDC guidelines say that you must have a follow on test, what's called the confirmatory test. You have to confirm it with PCR. You can't just de uh, uh, depend on the antigen test. And with regards to a uh, uh, antibody test, I, I don't even know why people do an antibody test. It's kind of like, uh, what it, 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 to me, I find no point in it.
Yes, just to clarify, the antibody test is testing whether you've had it, not whether you have it right now. Right. Where PCR test is testing whether you have it right now. And that's why it's accurate. But you also mentioned something that I want to um, clarify because you said that under the CARES Act, everyone can get a free PCR test. With that said, how often should one get tested? And who should get tested? First of all, everybody should get tested. You know what? Nobody, everybody, you know, this, this virus, is that it's really hopefully a lesson in compassion and love. And what do I mean by that? The reason why you wanna know if you're positive is you don't want to infect other people. It's not only about you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this entire notion of like, oh, I'll get tested, I'm not sick, blah, blah, blah. It's a terrible attitude because again, as in that small um, intro, asymptomatic people, okay, that's too much of a science word. People with no symptoms, people who don't feel anything, people who seem healthy can be carriers of this virus, okay? And so if you're a carrier and then you, let's say you were, you just got to college, you decided to go and party in your fraternity and then you go back and then you, and then you suddenly visit your 65 year old mother and you say like, no problem. Well, your grandmother gets sick. I was just shocked the other day. There was a family of eight from Austin, Texas. Five of them died, five, okay? And you know, it, and it started from a single infection. It, 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 you really have to be considerate of others. It's consideration of others more than anything. It's not about you. It's about the people that you love, the people you interact with and your community. I remember, Yobi, when I interviewed you for So Janelle not too long ago, you also said that, like, can you imagine that? Can, can your conscience take that? If somebody dies because they picked up the virus from you, that is a reckless homicide. <laughs> That's a strong description, but I, it is, I, I don't think anybody in the United States doesn't know that this virus can kill. I think literally everybody here in this country and probably the world knows that this virus can kill. And yet with that knowledge, if you, so, if you so recklessly decide that you would just go about your daily business and not wear masks, not socially distance, not know your testing status. And if you kill somebody, sounds like reckless homicide to me. And, and this is again, an exercise in loving people around you, your community, your family, your friends, and even the people you don't know. Right. So um, if, if there are any other questions, like I said, this is like a chat, so you're free to chime in. Um, there is a question in the Q&A window. Okay, yes, there is a question, yes. Okay, hold on a second. Uh, uh, so if they, here is a question from Julian. Uh, I have a friend, is it correct? I have a friend who had COVID-19 and recovered. She recently tested negative. Is there a risk of contracting the virus being around my friend? So there, worldwide, there's 25 cases of reinfection. So it's not a lot, right? So the assumption is still that you, de you develop some sort of immunity uh, mm -hmm. after you get the virus. However, again, there have been 25, which is not a lot, considering that there are 8 million cases in the world of reinfection. And when I mean uh, 25, these are 25 documented cases, not just 25 anecdotal cases. These are, these are cases where people had kept the virus sample, they were tested, and when they, were re when they got sick again, they looked at the virus. What they did to verify reinfection is they looked at the molecular structure or the DNA of the virus. The virus has mutated or mm -hmm. has changed its form many, many, many times over. So two coronaviruses, um, SARS-CoV-2 viruses are not necessarily the same. Their genetic structure is different. 
So in these 25 cases, they were able to go and look at the prior, the prior uh, genetic signature, and then the second reinfection's genetic signature. If they were both different, clearly it's a reinfection. And there's only 25. So, but the answer is uh, generally, uh, there is an assumption of immunity, uh, but there's no guarantee. And again, I would, I would go and ask my, uh, my colleagues here who are in the medical field to uh, maybe opine on that later. I think you'll be also the, uh, maybe what the question meant was, um, if somebody has it and recovered and I start hanging out with that person, do I risk myself getting it? I think the, the answer to that, the answer to that is also, uh, it depends, right? So even if you are, have cured yourself, right? The only way for you to make sure is you have to retest, okay? As long as you have a viral load or what they call shedding the virus, okay? You are still infectious. You may not have symptoms, so you're no symptoms in the beginning, you get it, and then you think you're cured. Well, guess what? You could still be carrying the virus and you're still shedding the virus. The actual length of time right now that, it, that people, are, uh, that scientists are saying like a period of you know, possible infection is not 14 days. It's actually 21 days to 28 days. So you're, you have to be sure that you're not shedding virus. And the only way you can know that you're not shedding the virus is you have to be retested again, mm -hmm. twice, <laughs> after right. you feel better. Right. Yobi, this is a personal question now while we're waiting for other questions. I'm going to take this opportunity, take advantage. Um, I, I have a one-year-old, like 23-month-old month son. He's turning two, but I take him to my mom's. My mom takes care of him. And mm. so I test myself regularly to make sure, but because he's 23 and can't do the swab or is there a better way or should, will that be enough or should he also get tested separately? They should be, I would test them separately just for, just to baseline it. Uh, I mean, the, the typical protocol would be you need a baseline. It doesn't almost matter what it is. Like if you wanted to look at let's say your cholesterol level, you know, you take one test and it says, oh, your cholesterol level is 100. Just baseline the fact that the child or the baby is not, doesn't have anything. And then, so you have a point of reference. Without a baseline, you're guessing. <laughs> you know, it's a total wild ass guess. Sorry, sorry for that. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> you have, this is science. You have to verify yes or no. Do you have it or you don't? guessing doesn't work right so there's no we can't make an assumption that if i'm negative since we were in the same household that he's negative i think there's a question that i'm seeing here on how does it compare to other countries oh um, okay oh yes how does testing look like in other countries by comparison uh, and, i only have experience in wuhan and south korea uh, because I've been involved in this since actually January. Um, so the, the, we, donated, we donated our test kits over to Wuhan, China, to PRC, and also to, and we sold our kits also to Korea, to South Korea. And I can tell you the big difference. Okay, on one end, we have a communist country, right? And in China, it was really easy. The government just said, Everybody's gonna get tested. Everybody's gonna be quarantined, done. There's no option. In South Korea, all voluntary. There's no, the government says you gotta be tested. Well, guess what everybody did? They got tested and for free mm -hmm. and it's available and it's instant. And you can get tested almost everywhere in South Korea. And if you get sick, they contact trace. What does contact tracing mean? They go, they go and try to figure out who you have been in contact with prior to your positive test, after your positive test, then they call them. They send people to find them. And then they go and tell those people to quarantine for 14 days. 
Another great, now both of those are pretty modern countries. China is largely a modern country, you know, uh, Wuhan is a very, very, very uh, advanced city and South Korea is, is a first world country. Think about Vietnam. Vietnam is probably as poor or ha has left as the Philippines, not a very rich country, but guess how many cases they have in Vietnam? Less than a few hundred. That's less than a hundred. And why is that? It's because the government decided to go and implement strict quarantine and strict contact tracing. In Vietnam, when you are supposed to be quarantined, they actually take you take you to a hotel owned by the government and you stay there. You're not leaving. They give you food, they give you water, they give you everything, you're not leaving. The net result of that is Vietnam is one of the least infected countries in the world. Population, by the way, almost 19 million. Right. I think that also says a lot about how the current administration is handling um, this yeah. pandemic. Yes, Yobi, I have one, one last question. Yeah. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, I, I hate to be political about, uh, about this because this is, I, I think this should not be a political question, but there are people, you know, I heard one of our leaders, you know, say it is what it is. Uh, some candidate for office, which I shall not, because this is not a political session, so it is what it is. That is, excuse my language, total BS, because you can get a handle on this. This is what other countries have done. New Zealand has zero, zero. Vietnam, I'm not talking about very rich countries. I'm talking about countries like Vietnam, Taiwan, South Korea, China, you know, they defeated the virus. We can do it, we're Americans. I mean, this is the richest country in the world. We can do this, but we need leadership and we need consistency. And it is frustrating. It's very frustrating. Well, thank you so much for uh, a lot of that information, Yobi, and for also uh, being candid with us, telling it like it is. Um, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, as a last note, this is a, she had a question, but this is, we'll close with her comment. Yes, we can manage this pandemic if we work together. It's all about strategy and leadership. Thank you so much, uh, Charity, for that. And on that note, we end this fireside chat with Yobi. Thanks again, Yobi. Thank you. And uh, Thank you, now, Yobi. yeah, yes, yay. <laughs> Always very informative. Um, and I also want to thank everyone for having me for, for this part of the program. Um, at this uh, juncture, um, Tim and Armbien will be taking over. I'd like to introduce you to Tim Castillo. He, he is a software engineer with a focus on healthcare tech at Bicycle Health. His passions lie in utilizing clinical data to improve patient outcomes. Bicycle Health is a healthcare startup and virtual clinic that provides medically assisted treatment to patients with opioid addictions. Also, Armbien is gonna be co-moderating this next part of the panel. Armbien is um, currently a third year JD student at UC Berkeley School of Law, emphasizing patent law and public policy. He earned his PhD in molecular and cell biology at UC Berkeley, studying the molecular mechanisms of embryo development. Post-grad, he will be joining the patent prosecution group of Cooley LLP in Silicon Valley. Armbien's patent work primarily focuses on life science technologies and medical devices. His policy advocacy focuses on equitable access to science, education, and research funding. Please welcome Tim and Armbien. Hi, Tim and Armbien. This is Erin. I'm so sorry. I We had a little bit of a mishap. Uh, Vice Mayor Jocelyn Manalo is on, so on deck, but we'll have the other two co-moderate in the next section. Um, I first, I just want to thank so much uh, again to Yobi for 
all of his tremendous work. I don't know if most folks on the call know this, but he and I had tried to coordinate test kits to the 550 Filipino workers on the SF Princess Cruise. Luckily, Assemblyman Rob Bonta, who's a good friend of mine and also campaigned for early on, um, handled that entire situation, which was very challenging, um, has donated generously to entire nation states of ventilators. Um, so he's been so active in this fight. Um, and again, thank you so much, uh, Janelle. Janelle is one of our uh, premier media partners at FASTER um, and has done a, a number of promotional videos for FASTER, interviewing myself, uh, Charity, who's on our national board, who's a uh, safety, health and safety expert, as well as Dino Ignacio, who is um, the lead designer at Facebook Reality Lab. So thank you so much for doing that. Uh, I'm gonna let Janelle get back to her family. She's so busy during this pandemic, is like everywhere um, for fam. So thank you so much, Janelle, and I'll take it from here. Ramik Salamat, thank you. And if you'll be, if you are so inclined to stay on, we'd love to have you. But if you have other things, I know you're so busy. Thank you again. Definitely. Um, so I'd like to welcome my two very good friends. Um, one who I'm proud is uh, at serving as an elected official in this capacity has been doing tremendous amounts of work uh, here in the Filipino American community. I remember when she was much younger, this is us maybe, I don't know, under 10 years, maybe over five years ago, she was interested in, in running for office. So I'd introduced her to um, Mayor, um, Daily City Mayor uh, Ray Bonaventura, and she has grown so much then. Um, the Honorable uh, Jocelyn Manalo. And following Jocelyn, we'll have um, my other good friend working now from Civic Engagement, my, my career there, and into technology, Julian Chung, uh, formerly at Oculus, uh, the Global Demo and Experiences team, uh, talking about their work in 3D printed PPE. Uh, one thing I'll note before, um, as I could rave about all of their amazing accomplishments, these two are doing so much for the community and are always innovating and are always pushing the envelope. Um, I do want to mention, because I had asked, I think them and others before, I have no idea what this looks like. And anyone in the chat can say it here. If there are other Filipino Americans have, that have done 3D printed PPE in their area, we do have a national uh, audience and scope uh, here in the United States. I don't know that anywhere else between New York, Los Angeles, et cetera, has done this. I know that Silicon Valley is really, um, you know, I don't want to say the Mecca or like the the central hub for a lot of innovation. So it's pretty obvious this would come from the Bay Area, but if anyone wanted to mention if there was anything like this out there that people are doing, uh, please mention in the chat. Uh, and with that, I'm gonna hand over the mic um, to Vice Mayor Justin Manal, who's can talk, going to talk to us about one, the 3D printed PP and how she's collaborated with uh, Julian, as well as just anything broadly that we should be you know, aware of in terms of civic engagement with, with this election as we are you know, in this pandemic of COVID-19, there's a lot of change Changes that have been made, um, whether it's voting and anything of that nature. So, Jocelyn, the floor is yours. Thank you, Erin, and um, everyone for having me this evening. Um, it is uh, so important for our community to hear from uh, the science and tech uh, field and all of you in your esteemed roles in really um, finding cures, finding innovative ideas in such a uh, a time in which we all didn't expect um, co this COVID-19 to occur. You know, as a local elected official in the city of Daly City, you know, I serve a lot of our Kababayans and there are close to 40% Filipino, Filipino Americans in the city. And, um, and with that, that means there's a lot of healthcare workers that we see uh, both nurses, doctors, or respiratory therapists. And so when this happened, even in our local hospital, Seton Hospital, uh, there, there wasn't enough protection. Um, and because of the national shortage, this was a real need. Um, and so really happy to work with Julian Chung, and, and which we were on phone calls yeah, with. Can you tell the story? You want me to tell the story? Go for it. This okay. is our a fireside chat. Like, this, this picture is, us at a fireplace, everyone. <laughs> it was a really fun story. Um, you know, I like technology. I know the brand um, yeah. Subea and Decathlon from, from being local, yeah. locally headquartered here in San Francisco. Um, and when I heard about the different research projects that are going on with the scuba masks, I thought to myself, well, you know, well, let's see what we can do. Um, and then I, I went online with, uh, with Justin, we tried to, 
see if we could just buy a couple. And it was locked out. Uh, as soon as the story broke, they had saved all of the units available for only civic purchases, only hospitals or only governments. So that was perfect because that's what we were doing. We wanted to investigate um, uh, this project. So yeah, that's, that's where it started. Uh, I connected Decathlon to Justlin and then we started the initial um, uh, negotiation for a purchase. Um, and then, yeah, I also have some of the videos of, of how the, the different uh, modifications are made to make PPE or to turn them into um, even emergency ventilators if you needed to. So I think this, this was a really cool uh, way that we could have as an emergency uh, reaction. Uh, this was literally the weekend that, I don't know if you remember, Gavin Newsom was repairing old ventilators that were broken. This was the weekend that Dr. Deborah Burks made a call to action to all local leaders to say, check your stockpiles, check your cupboards, make sure you have all your CPAP machines, even the broken ones, take, take note of what you have on hand because it might really hit maximum all ICUs, right? So that, that was the main preparation in mind. It's like, well, let's imagine if Italy happened here. This is, we're talking about March 20, March 25th, right? We, nothing has happened yet but we're trying not to have Italy happen in California or Italy happen in where we are. Uh, or So we, we're moving to position ourselves. There was a lot of great benefits here. You wanna go, can we go through the slide? We can, we can show them a little bit. Uh, let's see. Aaron, can you go to that page? That, oh, sure. Or, or... Actually, do you wanna screen share since you had some videos on there? I wanna make sure the audio picks yeah, let's, up too. Let's see. Okay, guys. Make sure I'm on the right page here. Uh, what page is it? It's in the fifties, right? Yeah. Sorry, there was my other mini intro that I skipped. <laughs> and there you are. Mm -hmm. uh, view. Yeah, can folks holler and see? If okay, guys. The Julian Chung PPE emergency ventilator project. It started off with the Stanford Research Group. Uh, there's some Italy researchers from an um, um, engineering firm called Innova Tech that also did a lot of great engineering to to kind of solve the actual plastic components necessary. Here's some specs of the schematics of when, when they're all available online. So there's uh, the, the first modification turns the scuba mask, which is uh, this scuba mask right here, into a PPE unit that uh, COVID ward uh, nurses can use instead of having to change through 30 masks a day. Um, the big thing that I worked on within the group was trying to resolve the app. Uh, I have a background with apps. So they, they were trying to get the app on the Apple store the whole time and it didn't really work. Uh, so long story short, we, we went with a uh, Apple or we went with a Samsung app that was a lot easier and uh, it just relays the audio. Uh, so you have a Bluetooth mic in there and you have this in your, in your pocket. And even if like they're a head surgeon, they can still be like giving commands and, and communicate through. And it, it was pretty cool. Uh, the, as soon as we were done with that project, it was able to go, how do you go to the next page here? There you go. This is what, what they did next. It, it was shipped to, is it playing? There you go. This was shipped out to, uh, uh, Prague, Czech Republic, I believe 2,200 units. As soon as, uh, as soon as it was done, they literally started, they sent out the print and then they printed them all, all there. Uh, and then Decathlon of course supplied the discounted units. But this is the first deployment right here. Pretty cool. It's really important to understand these masks are affordable, you know, so this is an accessible option for people all over the world. Like you could imagine, you know, Philippines, uh, Africa. Yeah, so th that happened right away. And then I think then the next step, which, uh, you know, as an emergency, let's say, you know, not necessarily planning for it, but this same subcomponent mask with a different valve, it's called the Charlotte valve and the Dave valve for the two different uh, medical applications for, the, for different hospitals. The exact same mask can be used as a ventilator solution. So let's take a look at, okay, unavailable, sorry, it was blocked. 
but it's uh, in Brussels, they have this with two different valves on top. And uh, basically there's an entry for the PEEP uh, ox and there's entry for oxygen. And uh, this is used for pre-critical stage where people still need a little bit of oxygenation support, but not necessarily, you know, full, into, full mechanical intubation. So this is more of a, let's say they ran out of the passive um, uh, you know, respiratory solutions. This is, these are the ones that work. And uh, in Italy, it, these masks literally save thousands of people. So it's nice to have them on hand. <clears throat> and we still don't know if we've seen our peak yet. So this very well could prove to be useful in the coming months, maybe perhaps December or January, there might be an, a flood in the Midwest or in California here itself. And some some local official or some 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 city or some hospital might suddenly need these units, and it's good that we have them here. So that that's where it came from. With this pretty much that very basic conversation over a few days, right? And uh, and Justin, of course, was was in the authority to make the purchase, and uh, we positioned ourselves. And other than that, it was just a matter of getting all the three D printers available. Uh, I have a list of all the local three D printers that we're willing to donate their time and their resources. And they're on, they're on standby. If we wanted to activate as PPE, we would print those valves. If we wanted to activate as an emergency ventilator and send it to the Philippines, we would get those valves too and then ship those out. So right now the current Daily City stockpile is just is, is at Seton Hospital and uh, we are ready to activate if need be. And, and I just feel we're a little bit more comfortable knowing that we wouldn't have to get to those extreme cases you know we and we have the support team from the local uh, Stanford engineering group which did the initial um, kind of vetting on this entire project so yeah that this is uh, my wife she took the initial I think uh, 20 units out to a COVID testing facility where they make COVID tests and we supplied masks for those guys too over in, in, uh, in Oakland so yeah this is this is the project that we did and very proud of it Justin, you have anything else to add? Yeah, you know, I, th I think it just um, in a time when we saw what was happening in other countries um, and seeing what could be possible, Julian saw the technology that was being created on the spot. And me as a local elected official is more around, well, we don't want to get to the place where Italy is when um, how can we use the technology that's being created right in our backyards in Silicon Valley um, to connect that with our local community. So it was really also around creating that uh, emergency stockpile that Julian mentioned. Um, and if it wasn't utilized here, then the thought process is how can we also send it to maybe the Philippines, right? Um, if they don't have uh, access to uh, you know, uh, ventilators there. Um, but it was really a fast process, long nights chatting with Julian back and forth around um, the new emerging technologies. And then on our end seeing like, okay, how do we procure it? And it was really fast, as he mentioned. I think yeah. prior to that, you as a pr individual person could order those masks, the scuba diving masks. And then in really swiftly, they only changed it to where municipalities or governments. Yeah, can we were on the website ordering <laughs> and it was live and the, what, they were available. And while we were there, it was saying unavailable, like colors were, were disappearing and sizes were disappearing. So as soon as the news was breaking and we were reacting to it, uh, I was like, oh my gosh, we have to call them directly. We have to so luckily I had that connection. We were able to make it work. But. Yeah, and, 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 and I think that's where we talk about um, innovation leaders like all of you and science and how do we collaborate with uh, government and um, obviously it wasn't as swiftly nationally, but what could we even do on the local level to support our community, um, our, our workers, especially on the front lines. So um, I'm happy to be here. I think, you know, we all know that this is such a crucial time um, uh, 10 days ago around impacting change on kind of the voting power that we all have as Filipino Americans and that it's important for us to get activated. And I'm honored to be here with all of you um, in the fields that 
you all are in and the impact that you're changing within our, our communities through science and technology um, and being role models for many of the young people out there that want to move into these fields. So thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you so right. much, Jocelyn, for your time. I know Jocelyn is super busy running around campaigning for the election, so thank you. Um, one last plug I did want to mention. So we had in our chat, Ethel Rubio mentioned that there were students in Daily City that are also doing uh, 3D printed masks. And another plug to Julian, because Charity on our board had asked, do you have a website? Julian is so amazing. He has two other well, websites for Safe Food Delivery, uh, safefoodsf.com and safefooddailycity.com, which he founded. Um, Jocelyn has her website as well and is very involved in civic engagement efforts as an elected official. Uh, so please uh, get involved. Again, um, FASTER is a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit officially. So if you want to look up voting, uh, apiavote.org, they're a national nonpartisan partisan nonprofit uh, it is really focused on that. So we want to make sure our community turns out to vote. And with that, um, there are no other questions. I'm going to graciously hand the mic off to, I think we, um, Janelle had read both the bios for Tim and Armband. So I'm going to hand over the mic to them as they introduce our two very esteemed um, panelists and presenters, uh, Professor Romer, who's out of Johns Hopkins University, is a professor of neurology, um, is also an MD. Uh, he says he's not a PhD, but he's actually taking care of a lot of um, patients that are, have been infected by COVID in the IC unit um, at Johns Hopkins, as well as Kim Gurley Carlson, who works at Cerner Corporation, who's gonna talk to us about COVID-19 data. So with that, I'm gonna hand over the mic to Tim um, and Arm Bien will be taking your questions. Myself and Aldrin will be moderating other parts of the chat because we're also looking at Facebook as well. So if you have questions, um, write them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, thank you again to Julie and Justin for your time today. Appreciate it. Uh, Armbian and Tim. Thanks a lot, Erin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Armbian Sibilio, and it's my honor to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Dr. Romer Jukadin is a tenured professor in the departments of neurology, anesthesiology, and neurosurgery at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and is currently the co-director of the Johns Hopkins Encephalitis Center. Romer is a graduate of the University of the Philippines in De Liman campus and, and the UERM College of Medicine in the Philippines. With funding from such prestigious agencies as the National Institutes of Health, Romer has published over 250 scientific articles and has a long list of accolades that you can read about in his faster gone bio. He's here with us today to discuss how the biomedical research community is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And so without further ado, I bring you Dr. Romer Jukadin. Do you want to turn on your sound, Romer? Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, okay, I'm struggling with sharing my screen. I don't know what's happening. One sec. If I'll have problems here, I'll probably uh, ask uh, one sec. Because it's telling me open system preference. Uh, you should have screen sharing abilities. Uh, can we ask uh, Kim to go first then? Because I'll figure this out. This is embarrassing. Sure. <laughs> no, they're okay. They're fine. We're we all Filipinos here. Zoom before. You need to restart Zoom after turning on your system preferences. Okay, we'll oh. let you all handle that. Uh, do we want to sure. Do you want to switch to another panelist? Do you want to switch to Kim? Let's switch to Kim. All right. So I am Tim Castillo, as um, Janelle has introduced me as earlier. And I get the privilege of introducing Kimberly Carlson. Uh, she has an MPH and serves as a senior clinical researcher at Cerner Corporation where she leverages evidence-based data-driven ways to improve the health of people and communities. She leads HIV research projects and coordinates Cerner's National Learning Health Network, which leverages real-world data to enhance and accelerate clinical research. She's a science nerd and social butterfly, an extrovert who enjoys being a connector, linking people and projects that align with one another. She serves as the director of social and cultural events for the National Association of Asian American Professionals, Kansas City chapter. And, you may, you may have the floor now, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Let me share my screen. All right, are you able to see my screen? No, I don't think we can see your screen. Um, do you wanna try again? Sure. 
Oh, I have host share on all panelists. You should be able to. Okay, we can see it. Okay, wonderful. So this just shows a summary of where you can find me on social media, et cetera. So feel free to connect with me, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Instagram, wherever. And I just wanted to start by touching on my origin story. So I myself did not go to UP, but my mother did. Um, she is from Imus Cavite, and here is a picture of my grandparents, my, who I've never had the pleasure of meeting. I, I was never able to meet any of my grandparents. Um, my parents had us when they were a little older, and they were also the youngest of very large families. So my grandfather was actually executed during World War II when my mom was five years old, and my grandmother uh, became quite the businesswoman and invested in land um, around Cavite to support her family and raise her five children. And um, how it's going now. So this is one of the most popular memes right now. Uh, here's a picture of my family. I have three brothers and I do have the privilege of growing up in a household where my parents did go to college and did work in the sciences. So my father was a microbiologist who earned his PhD. He was the first in his family to do so. He grew up on a farm in rural Illinois and him and my mother met in the laboratory in Winnebago, Illinois. She was taking a break before her last year of medical school in the Philippines and just felt the need to come to America and she never returned to the Philippines or her medical studies. So her path is, is not the straight line that she thought it would be, but we have a wonderful family and she has lots of grandkids as well. And here she is in her skydiving uniform. She's quite adventurous. And for her 70th birthday, she wanted to go skydiving. So I took her. On her 60th, she was riding camels in Morocco. So I love her adventurous spirit and it's been an inspiration for me. She did go on to become a nurse. She went back to school when she was 45 and started nursing school and worked as a nurse until retirement. So growing up in the Midwest, uh, a lot of you who live on the coast might take it for granted how easy uh, of access you have to Filipinos and the Filipino community. But for those of us that don't live in those coastal regions, we really have to seek that out. So how do I do that? And, and how do I encourage other people to do that if they're in similar situations? I think if you work for corporations that have ERGs, BRGs, and ABRGs, um, like at Cerner, we have the Cerner Associate Business Resource Group that's called Inspirations. That's a great way to connect with people in, of similar cultures and just find friends and network. Of course, lots of places have a local Filipino association. So growing up in Topeka, Kansas, the capital of Kansas, it's only 200,000 people there, but we had a very large Filipino association. So we all found culture and community with each other. I danced tinnikling, uh, we sold barbecue at all the festivals around town. And then uh, recently I've been engaged with the National Association of Asian American Professionals, which is known as NAP. And they have 27 chapters around the United States, also in Toronto and one in Asia. So definitely finding and connecting. Filipinos are everywhere. Uh, we're very friendly and welcoming. And for those of you that are not on the coast, encourage you to utilize these ways to find each other. This is our one of our local restaurants that actually just closed due to COVID. Um, just the business, it's a very small business. So again, support your local restaurants. Casey Pinoy was one of the two restaurants in Kansas City, which has 2 million people here in our metro area. So now we're down to one Filipino restaurant. So if somebody wants to move here and open a Filipino restaurant, it would be welcome. But support your local restaurants and order Filipino food, please. I wanted to touch on briefly my career path. Like my mother's, it was not the straight and narrow that you thought it would be. And I think a lot of people's isn't what you thought it would be. So I was born in Topeka. I knew that I was interested in science and my father we, was a microbiologist so I always had microscopes growing up around the house and I would look at things like dirt and boogers and leaves or anything underneath the microscope to see what it looked like at that level. Uh, when I went to college I pretty much majored in partying for the first several years and did not go to class very often and then I took microbiology and I thought this was the most fascinating topic I'd ever heard of. So I really had a connection there. And from then on, it was really easy for me to focus on my studies after I found what I was passionate and interested in. So after all I knew was I wanted to leave the Midwest and I thought I was interested in cancer, but also in infectious diseases. So I applied for a job 20 years ago. 
I flew to Boston. I looked in the newspaper and that's where jobs were posted back then. And I called up and applied for a job at Harvard. I did not have the greatest GPA, um, but I had a passion and an interest in science. And I was hired at a Harvard laboratory for vaccine and virology research that actually has produced the Johnson & Johnson COVID vaccine that is under phase three clinical trials now. So there I worked for three years trying to develop an HIV vaccine in uh, primates right before it goes to human trials. Um, there, the vaccine development, so HIV vaccine development has been studied for 36 years and we still don't have a vaccine for HIV, but it has a, had a great impact in the COVID vaccine um, accomplishments because we've been prepared and we have so many different vaccine modalities that have been developed um, as possible vaccines for HIV that they've been able to utilize a lot of those models to for COVID vaccines. And that's exactly what happened in the HIV lab there um, to make the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. After that, I so one thing that I think is really important for younger people to know is know your personality. I love science, but I'm very outgoing. So being in a lab and working at the bench 40 hours a week was not a good fit for my personality. I thought about getting a master's in public health and as a way to connect me more to um, a more interactive career, but still working in health. And something that I really emphasize is doing an informational interview. A lot of people haven't heard about this, but I called the state health department. I didn't know anyone there. I just said, can you connect me and let me talk to people that have a master's in public health so they can tell me what they do all day. And they set up eight one hour interviews for me with people that had this degree. So I would know if I was making the right decision and spending my tens of thousands of dollars going back to school to attain a degree that would be useful to me to get the kind of job I wanted. And I highly recommend that people love to tell you what they love about their job, what they don't like about their job, what they would do differently. And it's also a great way to connect and network and get an into a company as well for future career opportunities. So I moved to Berkeley. I love the Bay Area. All of my mother's family live there and I could go to a place where uh, my Thanksgiving at my cousin's house and there'd be 75 Filipinos of, you know, of, of my family. And I absolutely miss that so much. And, and it was great to be in the Bay Area where there's such diversity and Asians everywhere um, after growing up in the Midwest. I still continued work there as an HIV vaccine development researcher at the California Department of Health and actually worked on African strains of the vaccine, which have never been in the United States or the UK. Um, but I really wanted to get out of the lab, which is somewhat difficult after your career has already been in the lab. So how do you make that jump from laboratory work to non-laboratory work? I think it's emphasizing that you have an interest in using evidence-based information and science to inform health decisions. And that's what I did. So then I moved to nonprofit clinical trials, um, testing uh, solutions that can both prevent pregnancy and kill STDs. And then 10 years ago, I moved back um, to the Kansas City area to be close to my family again. And I started working for the National Clinical Training Center for Family Planning, training clinicians at 4,000 family clinic clinics nationwide, and also training the HIV prevention workforce through a CDC grant. Again, this path has not been really straightforward, but it's all based on um, utilizing evidence-based information and science to improve health outcomes. For the past two years, I've been working at Cerner, where I both manage the longest running HIV study in the United States that started at the CDC in 1993. And then I also help coordinate research through a network that leverages big data. And that is kind of the focus of how I will transition into what we are doing with big data as it relates to COVID-19. So people may have heard of Cerner as being one of the largest electronic medical records in the country, and they've been digitizing health records for over 40 years now. There's 27,000 employees at Cerner currently who speak 80, 80 languages, and we're in almost 6,000 hospitals nationwide. So when the COVID pandemic hit, we thought about how we could help leverage that clinical data that we have to help inform solutions. We do have a national data set. It's called Cerner Real World Data. 
It contains de-identified patient data from our client health systems that have agreed that their patient data can be used for research if it is de-identified. This data set contains almost 90 million patients. So what we did to act quickly was to curate a subset of that national data set to include only COVID-19 positive patients. And we offered that data set to academic and nonprofit researchers for free. So the premier academic institutions in the world, including the one that Romare works for, um, have access to this data set and are working with the most brilliant minds at these universities to learn more about COVID-19 uh, COVID and how it's affecting patients. So how this data set is being used by uh, over 40 institutions nationwide is people are looking at social determinants of health and how zip code, um, age, race, et cetera, are affecting health outcomes in COVID patients, different risk factors and comorbidities, mortality trends, how, when are people more or less likely to die, um, the comparative effectiveness of treatment. So depending on what drugs they're taking, um, is that working better or less than other types of treatments? Are, what are the racial disparities? and other things like that. So that's how we are leveraging data at Cerner um, to help COVID-19. And a lot of these publications are coming out um, already. We have a couple of academic institutions that have already published and many more to come over the next several months and years. The data set of COVID-19 patients uh, at the last refresh in late August had over 115,000 patients nationwide. So providing that access for free to the best researchers in the world is really important because it can, data can only provide insights and answers, but only if it can be accessed. Um, so I expect when we refresh the data set next month, it will dramatically increase beyond, well beyond that 115,000 patients. Um, and we look forward to sharing all of the research that's been conducted with the data sets as widely as possible. Kim, did you have your set of questions you wanted to start asking, Kim? Yeah, of course we do. Yes. So uh, as a heads up, the chat is now open for any questions that anyone may have about Kimberly, um, her background and her work. Um, thank you for a great overview about your history, what you've done, uh, your passions, what you do, and what you're continuing to do, and how Cerner's contribution in terms of data in, in the COVID-19 battle. So um, let's go to our first question. Yeah. Let's take it pretty general in terms of what you've done and how your work has been. And so let's start with, do you have any interesting insights in your experience that you've worked with to glean from your research and work about Filipinos? So not specifically related to my research results, but I do want to mention the need for greater inclusion of diverse populations and persons of color, and especially underrepresented groups in clinical research studies, including women, Asian, Asian Americans, Native populations, and transgender individuals. There's a really big push right now for diversity in the current COVID vaccine trials to get groups, um, both that are racially diverse, um, diverse in gender, et cetera, included in those trials so we know the actual effectiveness of these vaccines and how uh, side effects may differ based on some of those differences. I also wanted to mention that as, as Aaron has stated, you know, Filipinos and Asians comprise a very large portion of the healthcare and scientific workforce. So the Filipino Nurses Association is very prominent in most cities and states, including Kansas City. And a woman named Celia Yap Banago was a local nurse here in Kansas City that made national headlines um, when she passed away due to COVID in April. Um, this was a story that was highlighting the critical need for adequate PPE supplies, but <coughs> still remains an issue today. And then I also wanted to highlight the need for culturally appropriate health communications for diverse communities. So COVID has highlighted this, the need for accurate information to be communicated through signs, um, information about wearing masks and physical distancing in a multitude of languages. And as vaccines become available, we need that accurate scientific information to be available at appropriate reading levels and in many, many languages. So everyone has access to the accurate information. And I believe Lizelle will be providing an example of some culturally centered health information for Filipinos um, coming coming up in a few minutes. Cool. I have one question in the chat. 
the Cerner's data set disaggregate Filipinos, and this is actually a question that Tim and I have discussed at length of like accurate data, um, is that disaggregated among Asian American and Pacific Islander or AAPI? I do not have the exact accurate answer to that, but I will absolutely be looking into it. But that is an, an issue and in national data, you know, it absolutely. Tim, yeah, did you have, want to continue with other questions? Oh, sorry. Did Armbian want to chime in? Oh, I just wanted to continue on that tangent because mm -hmm. uh, it's something that's super interesting that I'm personally invested in too. It's how do you feel about the disaggregation and how, how do we feel about um, the special, the, the nuances of being Filipino when we're looking at clinical data and we're, when we're looking at data in general, especially I, at a population level? I think it's another reason that we need to have diverse people working at all levels, including senior levels, because we have to say that this is an issue and that there needs to be more uh, granular data captured to accurately inform health outcomes. So being the one and not being afraid to speak up and be direct that this is an important need for this greater diversity I may have another question, a side comment. Um, I don't know if other folks on, in terms of our panel wanna chime in here. Uh, so again, FASTER is a 501c3 nonpartisan nonprofit. I'm just gonna plug that there. Most people uh, do know that I've been involved in uh, other partisan work. Uh, one of the presentations I actually went to today was um, uh, UC Berkeley is starting, and this is out of the Asian American Studies program in the Ethnic Studies Department. Um, the Asian American Research Center had a presentation by Teiko Lee, uh, so actually was very prominent in releasing uh, a lot of information in terms of collecting, um, this is, it seems unrelated, it's on voter um, attitudes uh, of Gen Z millennials all ages. And what they flagged as one of the most important for young folks was actually, if you are Vietnamese, you're more likely to care about these issues. And then for Filipinos, it was actually on undocumented and DACA. And so it, I've actually had this conversation with my family We've had a lot of people that we know, at least in our family, it's about 10 people infected with COVID-19, uh, two deaths in the family. And then I have other friends who are Latino where multiple family members have been killed. Some are documented, some are not. And you know, between all of our families, luckily everyone that is a nurse on the front line um, is documented, has papers, everything like that. Um, but we're not say like Latino or we're like worried about, how about everyone else who has family working in the fields? Do they have healthcare? Do they have X? I guess my question to you, Kimberly, is, you know, how is Cerner collecting data from the hospital systems? And what does that outreach look like if you know um, towards different um, underrepresented communities of color? Because I think for our community, we, uh, from a lot of the different um, centers that people are looking at. So for example, UC Davis um, Bolasan Research Center, which was founded by uh, one of my mentors, uh, Professor Robin Rajigas, who's a professor in Asian American Studies. They've been putting out mental health surveys. They're trying to collect a lot of data, but what we end up seeing is that there's this big discrepancy when you're looking at immigrant populations, primarily undocumented, it's, it's hard to get. So what is the data from what we have? How is that being collected? Um, I guess at the hospital system level from a, corp a private corporation. I'd love to know more of your thoughts there. And, and knowing those are some of the challenges, what are ways that we can address that issue? Sure. So the way that this particular data set is collected is our client health systems can opt in to share data that we will then de-identify through HIPAA and Safe Harbor technologies, including date shifting, removing all personal identifying information, and only going down to the first digit of zip code, um, all sorts of algorithms to make sure there's no chance of re-identification there. Um, this data set is, does not, there are some limitations to it. So we don't have survey data. We really have those discrete, like things like lab results. And we're definitely working towards getting more information like that, but looking at clinical notes and imaging of chest x-rays, et cetera, that information has a lot of personal identifying information in it sometimes. And we, for this data set, especially with the 90 million patients, we wanna make sure that we, privacy is of the utmost importance to us and our clients. So we de-identify it. And then we actually have a governance council that is made up of health systems that contribute that data that decide what type of research it is actually approved with that data. 
So the people that are contributing the data are the ones that decide what research is conducted because they decide whether these research studies are done in good science and really to improve patient outcomes. Erin, you're on mute. So we actually have a couple, uh, this is Dr. Uh, Eric Daza, who's a data scientist that was on a, our live AMA with Charity had sent over. I'm gonna paste them into the Zoom chat because we have some people on Facebook that are actually commenting on this issue. Um, I'm just gonna paste it there. And then Tim, do you wanna go through the rest of your questions? Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, how are you on time though? I think maybe one or two more will be good. And then we'll, I'm gonna double check and see see the chats because I know there's a, a couple. Sure, let's take this question off the cuff because I know we have a lot of students in the audience and you mentioned you have a passion for, uh, as you told from your example about how using inter informational interviews as a way to find out like whether or not your next step is the right next step. Do you have any other tips for uh, students or people in education or academia about how to figure out their next step? Sure, definitely, I think Networking is absolutely key. Do not be shy about it. Uh, most people, a lot of people get jobs through networking. I got the job that I had before Cerner through networking. I got the link to my Cerner job through networking through somebody that I knew. So it's really putting out your feelers to anyone and everyone you know and making those connections and they can help you get ins at, at corporations and provide you, you know, um, highlighting opportunities. I think also mentoring and men being a mentee is also extremely important. So finding people that you look up to, but also making sure that you're mentoring down. And right now, one of the hottest topics that I keep seeing everywhere on Facebook and, and Instagram, et cetera, is that if you are over 35, that you need to have a mentor that is younger than you to stay up to date. Uh, to stay up to date uh, in what is actually going on. Like we always think that your mentor should be older than you, but that's not really the case, if, especially if you're working in tech and, and things like that. So I, I really like that. And I've been thinking about who I want to mentor me, who is younger than me. Um, but don't be afraid to try new things. So I actually was a human sexuality teacher also for five years at the university. I saw that there was a information gap. Here I was training clinicians that 4,000 clinics nationwide, and I saw that they were still uncomfortable talking about gender, talking about pronouns, talking about sexual practices, and this is a disservice to the health of the patients that they're seeing, so I decided that we needed to start younger. I grew up in a household where sex was never spoken about, and it is our chance um, to change things that we think can be improved, so I proposed a new course to the university um, to be a human sexuality course for health profession, future health professionals to get them used to having communication. When you think about sexual health is not a, about sex, it's about pregnancy, it's about preventing diseases, it's about uh, communicating and how to have a healthy relationship. So everybody needs these skills. And that course that I started as an elective is now required course for all future health professionals at the uh, state university here. So again, just take a chance and propose something that you might, that you think that could make a difference in, in people's lives. Um, I think negotiation skills, especially for women, is of great importance. Most men are negotiating their job salary at every interview and women rarely do it. So there are so many tips and scripts online, absolutely study those up, they work. You'll get what you want. And then just embrace your path and, um, embrace being different. You know, I was, when I was younger, I wasn't that confident about what I was doing. None of my friends were into science and I thought it was super nerdy, but really this is what I feel passionate about. And when I went to Berkeley and attended my master's of public health, I don't think I missed a single class because when you find what you're passionate about and interested um, in, it's just such a pleasure to be a lifelong learner and continue to learn more about um, your interests. So those are some tips there, but definitely don't hesitate to reach out to me, anyone that's listening, anyone on the panel here, we are here and we're happy to share insights. So please connect with us. Great, and we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A with both of you. So I'm gonna hand off the mic over to Tim.
Um, I'm going to hand over the mic generously to Jennifer, who is also Romer's classmate. I did not know that at first when uh, I watched uh, your COVID-19 panel, um, but she also is, in addition to being a pediatrician, um, was a congressional candidate in Florida, uh, Congressional District 1. She can talk also about uh, having COVID. I think we, you're the only person on this panel uh, who has actually had the disease and recovered, so you can talk about that as well. So um, the floor is yours, turning the mic over to Jennifer. And if you want to stop share, Romer, that would be great. Oh, am I still sharing? I think you still are. Yeah, they need to see my face, Romer. <laughs> Pasensia, classmate. Oh, it's more dramatic. <laughs> there you go. ta -da! So, uh, magandang gabi, mabuhay, and I am a proud Filipino-American. I was born and raised in the Philippines. Um, actually, my father um, was born in Bacolod, Romer. Um, also really? in a fishing village. Yes. So I can speak a little longer, but my mother was born in San Carlos City in um, Negros um, Occidental also. So I can speak both. I'm a better Cebuana than I am an Ilongo, but I eat bachoy as much as I eat everything else. So um, this is very interesting, I hope for everybody. I am here to give a face to COVID. And I think um, you, I am deeply honored to be in this prestigious panel because I have been listening for hours and hours and I am not bored, I can tell you. Because everything they have said, I can concur. I can tell you exactly what happened to me. And let me, let me just um, take you to my journey because I think the problem is we're talking about 220,000 deaths and counting, but we must also talk about some of us who have survived and it is real. The suffering is real, the fatigue is real, the long hauler symptoms are real. And if we do not speak and highlight these kinds of cases, we are missing a big portion of who we can help and, and what we can do in terms of the long-term complications and, and the consequences of having COVID. So let me start, as I said, I'm uh, Dr. Jennifer Mihara Zimmerman, proud to say Mihara, my parents are both Filipinos. I did graduate from the University of the Philippines together with Romer. I, yes, we were party animals in our dorm <laughs> at one point. I did take my medical schooling seriously. I did go to UERM too. Um, and, and yes, um, although I had, I also did not go a straight line. I was involved in a lot of things, but ne um, never did I ever imagine I would end up in politics. I went to the US to seek a better life, just like most Filipino stories. Um, I was on full scholarship, the only reason I was able to go to medical school. Uh, my parents were not very lucky, we weren't well off, but because of scholarships and, and higher education, we were able to better ourselves. I trained in New York and that's where I met my husband. He's a Jewish boy, so my children are called cashews, Catholic and Jews, <laughs> and um, very proud Philams. Um, so we celebrate Christmas and Hanukkah my kids love it. They get a lot of gifts because <laughs> Hanukkah is seven days or eight days and of course Christmas. Um, so coming from that background, I am, um, you might be wondering how I ended up in politics. I live in a very red state and I don't mean this to be in a, a political talk, but I am very passionate about healthcare because growing up, um, my parents, of course, were not well off. And every time one of us got sick, it was a mad dash. My, my, my um, responsibility was to take out, now I'm dating myself. We did not have um, Apple Pay then and uh, Venmo and all that stuff. I had to carry the passbook. It's actually a book that tells whoever is looking at it, how much money you have in the bank. I carried that so that if you went to the hospital, they would let you enter because you had the ability to pay. And I carry that all throughout my life thinking why, why is healthcare not open to everybody? And so when the opportunity arose to confront my congressman here in Northwest Florida, and you might be interested to know if it was Matt Gates. Um, if that name isn't familiar to you, I guess you need to Google him because it's, it's, uh, he's very interesting. Um, I, I brought out the topic of healthcare and, and people reached out to me. And so I'm very active in the community now because I want to bring um, not only the hazards of not having healthcare, which is a very big issue right now, because people have employer-based um, healthcare. And if you didn't, um, 
you know, if you became unemployed during this pandemic, which is another issue that is not being talked about, you lost your health care. Now, I am very lucky. I may have lost the congressional race because I'm a very, very small blue dot in a very red ocean here. But I was able to move forward the discussion about what is necessary. And in this pandemic, now I know why I am not in Congress. I'm in the community as a pediatrician. I am in the front lights teaching. Uh, I mean, uh, I am with the um, students who have now gone back to school. And in fact, in our high school right now, we have the highest rate of COVID cases in the entire state of Florida. Um, when I tested positive in late June, there were only 9,000 cases of COVID. As of Sunday, mid-October, there were 755,000 cases in Florida. We went from 9,000 when I was infected to three, four months later, it's 755,000 and counting. If we do not get this under control, there will be more cases like me. I am e extremely grateful. I survived, but let me take you through my journey. I went to work on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, absolutely no symptoms, perfectly fine. I'm highly energetic. I'm like an energizer bunny. Thursday morning at five in the morning, I woke up and my heart <laughs> dropped to the floor. I was febrile, 103. Shaking chills, extreme backache, extreme headache. And I said, I think I know what this is. I went, I called my friend. This is, I'm lucky. I'm a physician and I have connections. Here, you cannot just drive up and be tested. You have to go to testing sites and you have to call first, make an appointment, and they will not test you unless you have symptoms. You can also go through a drive-through where you might have to wait a couple of hours and may not get your results anywhere from seven to 20 days. This was during the early times of the pandemic. This was in late June. I called up my friend who heads the COVID unit in the area, said, Jennifer, come on right here. That's not good, don't go to work. So of course I didn't go to work. Being a responsible person that I am, I knew that if I was a health professional touching patients with fever, I would be a super spreader. Therefore, I got tested for strep and flu, negative. Tested for COVID. Within 24 hours, I received the bad news that I was positive. I immediately had several of my family members who were living with us to have them tested too. My husband who's immunocompromised and a lot older than I am tested negative. My youngest daughter who's 14 tested negative. My 25 year old son unfortunately tested positive. But he only had three days of suffering. 25 year old, no pre existing condition, pretty healthy. Mid 50s woman over here, who's also a healthcare worker, most likely got the most of the viral load. I can tell you that I suffered through six days of intense fever and chills. This is the face of a COVID survivor who's very, very lucky. I did not have respiratory symptoms until day 11. I had a period where I thought I was fine between day seven to day 10. In fact, I went to the COVID clinic and say, hey, can you clear me back to work? I feel great. Sounds familiar? I feel great. I think I can go back to work. They cleared me because you only have to be a febrile for 72 hours or without symptoms. And if you don't have any other symptoms, you can go back to work. I woke up on day 11. I was about to go back to work. And guess what I had? Chest pain chest pain, and for the first time in my life, it hit me. Dang, this is COVID. Previous to that, previous to that, between day one to day six, aside from the fever and chills, which I'm telling you is no joke, is no joke, excruciating pain in my entire spinal column, most especially the lower back pain. And, the, and, and Romer was mentioning about the neurological symptoms. I was drifting in and out of sleep. Either I had insomnia, which I couldn't go to sleep or I was extremely drowsy. That I would sit, you could talk to me and my eyes would just close. Completely, you cannot stop the symptoms. I lost my sense of taste and smell by day three. Unfortunately, well, the weird thing is the only thing that stayed with me was the sense of sweetness. The, the taste, the, the, the being able to taste everything as if it was with sugar, which for some people might be okay, but I don't want my Cine gun to be sweet. <laughs> um, my mother who's in San Diego panicked because I already had another family member who was intubated three, uh, three weeks prior to that and suffered in Vegas. 
So everyone in my family thought, OMG, she's going down. <laughs> and um, sent me boxes of Sinigang, <laughs> Arascaldo, you know, the typical Filipino comfort food. My husband's Jewish um, fam our friends um, sent over the Jewish penicillin, which is chicken noodle soup. So, so Jennifer, every we are week so short on time. I'm so sorry, I may have to stop you. Um, can you mention the last two quick things that we did talk about is you did recover, number one, and then two, you, you are a pediatrician, right? So you treat children. So you wanted to yeah. talk to about how you are protecting yourself so that you don't infect others because you were someone who had COVID. Can you talk more about that? And also because you mentioned the high schools, right? In, in terms of the spread yes. with young people. Can you address this, those two last main parts? I do want to make sure that Lizelle so, and Charity get to speak. So actually, actually the, the, the most important um, takeaway point there is when I went to work that Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday before I became symptomatic, I was wearing PPE, my mask, hand washing. And if I had to check someone with fever, I actually had the uh, face shield and everything else that was recommended by CDC, I followed. Not one of the patients that they called ever tested positive. And I checked babies and I checked children. Now, the problem we have here is that 80% of the school children in my district went back to school, brick and mortar school. My own daughter, who's a freshman in high school, much against what she wanted, I made her do remote school. I'm glad. Because just last week, as I said, the, the, the county, I mean, the state of Florida announced that our high school had the highest number of cases in the entire state of Florida, the entire state of Florida. So my daughter is protected at home. Um, I have to deal with it. I have to wear PPE. I have to make sure. I did um, donate plasma um, in my, you know, a few weeks after um, they say you have to be a symptom asymptomatic for two weeks and then you can donate plasma. I do know that I have antibodies um, and um, my antibodies apparently are rich in, in <laughs> anti-COVID stuff, but um, I do not take it for granted. I still presume that I can have at any given time transmit this disease. We never go out without a mask. I always show people, and I'm not afraid to say or embarrassed to say that I am a survivor. I'm very proud to say that I survived I, and I did not infect anyone else because I practiced what was in the CDC guideline. I do social distancing or physical distancing with my patients. I would love to hug my patients again. The newborns, the babies, the children, they all want to hug me and I have to put my hands up and I have to say, I'm sorry, this is to protect you. And they believe me because I have been a pediatrician here for 20 plus years and they understand no one comes to our clinic without a mask. So if there's any takeaway here, I don't care what political affiliation you're, in, you're with. I mean, it's not politics, it's common sense. It is shared responsibility. We are so big on being personally responsible for what we do in life, how much money we make, what car we drive and all the big flashy stuff. But this is shared responsibility, folks. We share the responsibility to protect each other. I know. I know I am a walking testament to the fact that because I wore a mask, I did not infect any patient. And I continue to practice social distancing, PPE. There has been nobody else. By the way, just as a side note, people would ask me where I might have contracted it if I was so careful. I put my guard down one time. My son from Massachusetts visited me with a couple of friends. College, asymptomatic, healthy young individuals. They came down to visit. I'm a mother, I haven't seen my son for so long. My son was in Massachusetts also uh, volunteering in a COVID ward, completely asymptomatic. They were, um, they came down. When they left, I cleaned up the, the place where they were in and that's probably where I got the viral load. I did not wear a mask cleaning the house. The one who helped me, who also tested positive was my son, the, my, my eldest son, no one else. We were protecting my husband who has a pre-existing condition and my youngest daughter because she was still very young, but only two people contracted in my house. And because I was healthy prior to that, I exercised, I, I, I'm not young anymore. And so I knew the risk I was taking. That's most likely where I contracted from because I called them right away. And within a couple of days that I tested positive, they tested positive. So it was most likely from those young asymptomatic college people that I, who were in my house for just a couple of days. 
no symptoms. So please, it's not political. It's shared responsibility. Wear a mask. It ain't gonna kill you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your remarks and, and sharing your experience with that such a sensitive issue. I'm going to turn over the mic to my good friend, Lizelle Tanglao, who is the chair of the PhilPro uh, Filipino Young Leaders Program uh, COVID-19 Task Force. She is also one of our media advisors for FASTER and has launched a podcast called Blood Debts on, fin uh, on finance, which is uh, just released. Uh, I was interviewed for. Uh, she also is the amazing innovation editor, senior innovation editor at Huffington Post. Lizelle, and do you want to screen share? Um, sure. I don't think I can. Can you? Can you actually screen share? Oh, you know what? Let me give you access. Uh, making you a co-host now, you should be able to do so. You have access to the slides that way you can drive them. Um, I'll just screen share. Can you guys see this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I'll put the, uh, the link in the chat. Um, so I'm Lizelle, I'm uh, with PhilPro, which is the Filipino Young Leaders Program. And um, just to, uh, um, just for the interest of time, um, I'm here to talk about the Caretaker Project and what that is. Um, so just like with everybody else, um, when the pandemic hit in the spring, um, we were all trying to figure out um, what, what we can do as a community. Um, and, for a lot of us who are alumni of the program, uh, we are scattered all over the US. And just like with everyone else, a lot of our interaction with each other uh, increased uh, via Zoom, uh, chats, and phone calls. And in many of these um, you know, conversations, we quickly realized that we all had um, kind of the same storyline, that a lot of our families um, you know, were part of the medical um, community as well as um, you know, part of uh, a lot of intergenerational um, communities. And we started to um, realize that um, and started asking ourselves, you know, since we are in many of these professions um, in the medical field, as well as just being essential workers, and we're so busy taking care of um, everybody else who was taking care of us. And one of our uh, alumni members um, was just like, well, wouldn't it be great to have some kind of playbook uh, we quickly realized a lot of us were struggling to have these difficult conversations with our older relatives who at the beginning of the pandemic weren't listening to a lot of the guidelines of like, stay home, you know, don't go out. And we, we just didn't know how to get through to them. And um, so ultimately it led to this idea of creating some type of community resilience playbook, which then led to something larger, which is uh, what you see here today, which is essentially a virtual help desk. And we went, um, we've been meeting for 26, 26 weeks straight since May to try to figure out what can we do as young leaders in our professions and in our industries and as a group to respond to that. Um, and this is what we came up with. And we were able to get some funding from the Booz Allen uh, Foundation through an innovation grant and basically enough for enough money for a pilot. And essentially, uh, what we have come up with is what you see here on the screen is Tayo. Um, so we like to say that this project is powered by us. So essentially it is our uh, version of a uh, help desk around COVID-19. So um, it has everything uh, from, you know, where can I get tested for uh, get COVID-19 testing um, and other things like mental health uh, um, articles, as well as you know, if I'm a J1 visa holder, like what do I, how do I, how do I navigate through a lot of these, a lot of these things? And we focused on three different areas um, within our community that we felt like were the most vulnerable. Our senior citizens, our frontline workers, which also include, is inclusive of not just medical, but as well as um, essential workers and the unemployed. Um, but, you know, anybody landing on this site um, can find more information within these categories. Um, because we only uh, received a certain amount of funding, enough for a pilot, we launched uh, last week uh, in LA. And the hope is that we will continue uh, to get more funding and iterate on this so that we could offer a resource that's reliable, um, that's curated and culturally tailored to us. Because there's nothing really out there um, that speaks to us, that is written for us. And um, this, all the articles that you see here are also gonna be translated into Filipino. If we get more funding, um, 
they will also be translated into other Philippine um, languages, um, Ilocano, Ikulano, and so forth. Um, and yeah, so we, for us again, like, you know, um, we saw this as an opportunity to not only provide and be that resource for our community, um, because we found it very terrifying, the, the rampant, um, you know, spread of misinformation out there among, um, especially our, our older folks. Um, and just like trying to even just like, you know, navigate through a lot of these like um, systems out there. Like if, like, how do I get my stimulus, stimulus check? You know, so this information is all out there, but it's not in one centralized place and it's not also written with us in mind. Um, so for us, it's really kind of bringing it back to kind of who we are as a people and trying to respond in a way where, you know, we kept asking ourselves, how can we be together when we can't be together? And as Filipinos, that's kind of a hallmark of who we are. Like we thrive on being together. And for us, this is one way we can try to help where we felt like we, we were feeling like, how can we help our people? Like information is a big, is a big part of that. So, um, so yeah, so that's the uh, caretaker project, the Sasayo. Um, and, you know, we are always constantly looking for um, any help possible in terms of like either for folks that want to serve as an expert or advisor um, panelist, um, because that's the other thing too. We want to, um, you know, encourage and engender that trust, um, you know, among um, the information that's being um, referred here and also uh, curated and created. Um, yeah, so that that is our project, and um, we hope to continue to keep, um, you know, being here for um, all our Kababayans. This is phenomenal work um, that I've been talking with Lizelle. I was like, how would we partner with Faster to do something? And I think on our end here, you know, as professionals in science and technology, there's a lot that we talk about in terms of um, misinformation. I know Lizelle and I talk about in journalism, like how we talk about vaccines is going to be really important. You know, if our community, you know, as we're thinking about how is that developed, we're thinking about vaccine developed in the Philippines, all these other things. What's something that we can specialize in? She's taking care of anything that's not the core sciences of tech and just in the services portion. They've done a really great job at Philpro. So uh, kudos to you on that. Just like a round of applause for like Liz for the, and Phil Pro for doing this work. Because I, I remember in the beginning of the pandemic, you were telling me like, I'm trying to get, you know, all the Philippines you know, leaders that are young to do something. And um, I'm really glad that you did. And this is just uh, amazing work. So I hope that um, through the call here um, that we're gonna be able to identify other folks for you uh, that may be able to advise uh, in other areas as well. Um, and now Charity had asked, what is the connection? Link? Okay, great. So actually Charity, you're uh, on doc next. Um, do you want to, I don't know that I, I had slides for you. I know that uh, we shared a video uh, that Janelle, had you um, interview uh, about um, uh, interview you about health and safety? Uh, do you want to come on board now, and then I'll have my ending remarks about what we're doing uh, for yeah. Faster, as well as some of the other uh, community causes that we support from Filipinos Feed the Front Lines, uh, a lot of different Filipinos that are making masks, things of that nature, and I'll talk more about data at the very end. So, Charity, um, can you give me screen sharing uh, ability? Oh, can I share? Yeah. Did I not give you access? Maybe I can. Let Did me you? make you co-host again. Okay, here we go. I forgot to make you closer there. And yeah, you should be able to share now. Okay, can you see? Then my screen. Yes, we got you. Yes. Okay, perfect. Perfect. I have like a bunch of slides, but I will try to go through them very fast um, and just give a little overview of myself. Um, give me one second, though. I'm going to close my door. My kids keep coming in and out. And uh, Give me one second. They're all playing music like really loud. Like right now when I go on, it always happens. <laughs> so I am Charity Nicholas. Um, I'm a principal consultant at a company called ERM. Uh, just a little bit about my background. Um, my parents are from Alocos Norte. And as I have spoken at other um, FasterCon conferences, I'm basically uh, a living uh, Filipino uh, history 
book because my uh, grandpa um, Ben was a World War II um, veteran. He actually fought in the Philippines um, for uh, the, the Far East. The uni- I think it's called uh, Uniform Forces of the Arm uh, Far East. It's not uh, you suffer, Yusuf. yes. You, United States. My father was a prisoner of the Far East. Yes. You, yes, you suffer. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So he fought. He was a colonel um, in the Philippine Army, and they recruited him. So um, he fought in the war. Uh, he was never able to come here, though, as part of the uh, Filipino Filipino World War II Veterans Project. Uh, he actually passed away before he was able to come here. And the joke between him and my dad is he told my dad, I bet you that I will get to America before you do. Because my dad graduated as an engineer and my dad was trying to get to America and they had promised all the World War II veterans that they would be able to come to the U.S. And he thought he would come here before my dad, Uh, but he did not. Uh, My other grandpa, Santiago, he actually worked in the uh, sugarcane fields in Hawaii. So uh, he was recruited also to work overseas. Um, he was a sakada and uh, he sent money back to uh, the Philippines, to my grandmas. Uh, my parents come from big families. My dad comes from a family of six and then my mom comes from a family of 10. Uh, they both came over with uh, the professional wave in the 19, um, early 1970s. Uh, with me. So I was, my dad came first, I came second with my mom, and I was about two when I came over. We landed in the south of Market. Um, So uh, we grew up in the south of Market. My parents were adopted by another Filipino family. Um, So a very quick story is that my dad landed in the U.S. and he had fifty dollars in his pocket. And he thought he, that was a lot of money, like in the Philippines, right? So when he came here, he had nowhere to stay. He was writing letters to his friends. He thought he'd be picked up and nobody picked him up at the airport. So uh, somebody on the plane who he met, who also was from Ilocos Norte, they spoke Ilocano. They took him in and they are are now our adopted family. And uh, we lived with them in a small apartment in the south of Market with about 13 other people um, for a few years until uh, we got settled and, and got our own house in the East Bay. Uh, I actually am um, an all-American girl. I grew up in the East Bay. I, in high school, I was uh, ASB vice president. I was head cheerleader. I didn't really know what it was to be Filipino. Like I thought I was, other than the Filipino food I ate at home, right? And when I got to Berkeley, that was a big wake-up call for me to realize that um, I had a Filipino culture. Uh, let me see. There we go. Here's my family. I now have a, um, I'm married. I have a husband and uh, four children and a new doggy named Layla. So, <laughs> and uh, I went to college at Cal, and that's where I, I met a huge. Oh, and this is my daughter. She, she loves to visit Zoom meetings. Uh, <laughs> So I graduated from Cal with a degree in biology and I uh, got my master's in public health from the University of Hawaii, as I mentioned before. Um, I traveled actually throughout the country uh, doing public health. I went into environmental health and safety. And uh, one of the big studies I did was in the crab processing plants. And I, I met a lot of Filipinos there uh, researching uh, the diseases uh, caused by crabs Um, crab proteins in the air, measuring those, and then also um, visited a lot of um, about 20 different mines throughout the United States was another big project that I was on, uh, measuring all the diesel exhaust, particulates, um, all the different hazards that people are exposed to. And so in my job, my main um, goal and focus is to make sure people are safe in the workplace. And that's why Aaron asked me to talk. And I'll talk a little bit later about um, my experience working um, with uh, COVID-19, uh, safe distancing protocols, return to work protocols, and, and what we're seeing and how you can stay safe when you go back into the workplace. Uh, this is a photo of some of the things I do after work. I call it my second job. 
Um, I do a lot of uh, community work. Uh, this is me uh, going back to Cal with a lot of students. You can see Faster is in the middle. I help a lot with FasterCon as um, the board secretary, a lot of student events uh, that we support. I'm also founder of a group called Tech in Color. This is a photo of our visit to Pinterest where we bring uh, students of color out to meet uh, different tech professionals and um, you know, we've done some site visits and this was our very first one at Pinterest. Uh, I also help with Pinayista, um, which is a group of Filipinas um, who uh, come together, educators, uh, small business owners, professionals um, to uplift and educate each other about all things Pinay. Uh, I'm also part of Collective Hustle, which is a mentorship program and FASTER is part of that mentorship program where we bring professionals and um, mentor students uh, to figure out what kind of career they'd like to uh, have in the future. This is me at my company, ERM. We are um, a company, a global company uh, that is in about 160 countries all over the world. Um, we have about 5,000 employees. This is our um, staff in the local office. And this is me with our um, CEO, uh, Karen James. So she's pretty amazing. She's from London. She's got a London accent, and I love doing that <laughs> when she visits. Uh, so this is me when I actually now go into the workplace. Uh, Everybody has, uh, well, all, all the workplaces that are open uh, that do have essential workers coming back uh, have uh, COVID-19 precautions uh, that have to be followed. So I'm wearing my mask. And this is when I, I'm at an industrial site, um, a chemical safety plant, uh, evaluating different um, safety procedures. So I'm going to talk a little bit about COVID-19 um, safety precautions. Uh, I talked a little bit about my company, just giving a shout out about ERM, where <laughs> we actually um, signed an agreement with about 50 other uh, global companies uh, that is making a stand about uh, environmental safety and making sure to uh, be part of um, the sustainability development goals established by the World Health Organization to make sure um, we are doing our part to minimize uh, pollution and uh, bring um, the planet back so that uh, you know, we can continue to uh, live in a safe world. Um, so here's a little bit about a lot of the things that we do. My area is health and safety. And in the global, global uh, COVID-19 pandemic right now, our big three focus areas are protecting employees, protecting businesses, and protecting uh, resilience uh, and planning ahead uh, for pandemic and epi uh, epidemic resilience efforts. Um, these are a lot of the big ticket items that we work on, um, you know, enterprise risk assessment, uh, virus trackers, creating self-reporting surveys, creating plan readiness. You'll hear the terms of sustainability, business continuity planning, a lot of these long-term plans on how do businesses and how do people plan for continuing to work during a pandemic uh, and still say, stay safe. Um, on the highest level, we work with uh, corporate crisis teams um, uh, by uh, trying to figure out plans. How do you bring people back to work? Who really is essential and who needs to be there? Um, and in the long term, um, when can you bring people back? Uh, what are the um, different protocols that you need to have? And uh, in the interim, uh, what are all the technology that you need to be using while people are working from home? One of the biggest things we're working on now is ergonomics. Uh, how are people working from home and, uh, you know, uh, staying safe while working on the computer and in Zoom meetings all day, right? Um, the second uh, thing that we do is we work on COVID-19 response teams. So here you see an example of locations, a large global company that might have uh, many locations uh, how many uh, cases they might have in the country, what kind of precautions they need to take. We do things called risk assessments, and that's what you see in the green, yellow, red um, chart. So if you're going to bring people back, what kind of precautions do you need to put in place? And if you have less precautions, you'll be in the red. If you have more um, uh, 
uh, prevention uh, program efforts, you're more in the green. Okay, and then here we talk about protecting the business, designing the strategy, creating compliance. So these are kind of high level, um, big ticket items, creating auditing programs, how do you reschedule work, um, encouraging remote training. Uh, if you are going to come back to work, um, you'll probably see um, different strategies that companies are following and um, you wanna make sure that your company is following these things. Uh, so the first thing is, <laughs> sorry. sorry, family things. Uh, first thing is preparing the building. The second thing is uh, preparing your workforce. The third is controlling access into the building. Uh, the fourth is creating uh, social and physical distancing. The fifth is reducing touch points making sure that you're sanitizing. And the sixth is a communication, communication, training, ensuring everybody knows uh, what your precautions are, delivery people, uh, visitors, employees. So uh, definitely making sure that we have all those in place. Uh, okay, hold on. I don't know why, but I cannot uh, go to the next slide. Oh, there we are. Maybe I went too far. Oh, sorry, went too far. Um, okay, there. Okay, so the four big mitigation steps we uh, focus on once people come back to work, access controls, uh, physical distancing, wearing masks, and uh, cleaning and hygiene. So this just gives you a high level example of things we have to do and think about for access control, right? Um, you think of your high risk groups, working from home, doing temperature checks. You'll see a lot of those. Uh, now they're coming up with um, independent stands where you come up to um, the temperature monitor, you push a button, it will uh, take your temperature and then let you know if you're the room, they might take your temperature again, then they have to have protocols on if you are positive, um, not let you into the building, and then they have to have a whole nother set of um, requirements for you to um, be seen by a medical provider, uh, get you home without infecting anybody else, right? So um, talking about all those uh, measures. Okay, even commuting, uh, companies talk about that, uh, whether you can commute or not whether you'll do ride sharing. Um, so that's all part of the communication. Here's an example of a temperature monitoring station, uh, employees coming back uh, or starting their day. And you can see even then on the left side, they're still having to physical distance while they're waiting to come into a temperature monitoring station. On the right side, you can see the arrows. They have to go through only one pathway in. Um, and then you can see the person uh, standing, waiting for their temperature to be taken. Um, there's a big thing with that is, you know, not recording what everyone's temperature is. So if they are positive, you don't want to keep that data. And that's all about you know, confidentiality um, yeah. and issues Absolutely. with that. Um, the second one is physical distancing. So we've yeah. talked about that, making sure that people are wearing masks, not contaminating. You'll see arrows that are in hallways um, or in rooms that are uh, used often like cafeterias. Um, not having more than um, a certain number of people in each of your meeting and conference rooms. So you'll see reduced capacity assigns in front of all those rooms, only two people max, four people max. You'll see everybody reducing the number of chairs, taking out tables um, from those rooms to make sure that you really can't have too many people in the same room uh, sharing space and uh, sharing uh, air that they breathe. So there's an example of a work area redesign and they're redesigning, uh, making sure that uh, when you come into a room, so this is a room where uh, it's uh, a clean room change and gowning area. And uh, you can see that the, on the right side, all of the lockers are very tall. So you can't see how many people are in the room. Um, so they have mirrors there so that you can see uh, if there are more than one person there, where they're located. You don't wanna be too close to them. And the other is we have people um, in companies that are actually logging how many people per hour are in different rooms that have or labs that are used uh, throughout the day so that we know um, when you have a max number of people, what times they're there, uh, making sure we're reducing that number as much as possible. And the third is protective coverings as we've all been wearing. Uh, the fourth is like signage, uh, making sure that you can see people are wearing masks, maybe face shields. On the right side, you can see all of the arrows. So if you are going back into the workplace and you're a essential worker, you'll see these things happening. 
Um, and the last is cleaning and hygiene, making sure that there's a plan for that. And what you'll start seeing is uh, sanitizer everywhere. Ha you'll see a lot of signs that say, please wash your hands. Um, making sure that uh, there's no reuse of tissues, um, everything is disposable. Um, terrible for the environment because we have a lot of disposable, disposables, but um, much safer for you. So that's in general an overview of uh, at least return to the workplace. Uh, right now, uh, you may have been hearing that we are in the middle of a spike. A lot of uh, people are starting to return back to work. Um, companies and businesses are opening children um, are returning back to school. Some of those schools are closing as they're getting positive cases. So um, as Yobi mentioned in the very beginning of the call, um, COVID is highly um, infectious. So you have to be very careful. And right now, um, the you get a questionnaire when you go into a workplace and they ask you, have you been in uh, contact with somebody who sorry who has a, a positive case right <laughs> who has a positive case or somebody who is COVID-19 positive and uh the time limit is like if you're with somebody um for at least 15 minutes who is COVID positive, um, you're considered to be uh, COVID positive or, or potentially COVID positive and you have to self isolate. That's very highly infectious, which is different from something like tuberculosis. Tuberculosis, the time limit for you to be with somebody uh, to be considered potentially infectious is eight hours. So um, you think 15 minutes of, is a very short amount of time. Um, so for me, that is the end of my general presentation, um, and I'm open to answer questions if we have time. Aaron, you're muted, I think. Oh yeah, Aaron, I think you're muted. Hi, sorry, I was totally muted and totally forgot. Um, so I know we are super over time. I am gonna share some quick slides on just like Faster's work and other folks that we partner with on COVID um, and then open it up to questions will be very, very brief. I'm actually cutting most of my talk. I usually don't give my story because I have to do it at least three other times in the rest of, um, the conference. So really, really quickly, um, folks can see my screen here and screen sharing. Can you holler? Yes. Okay. So that's me. Um, Faster Science for Filipino Americans Esteem. We started in 2015. You saw Charity's beautiful photos that she had presented. Um, we have other events that are happening the rest of the weekend um, with the chat. Um, all if you can paste it again, we have uh, registration links for tomorrow, Tech and Arts Day, and then our breakout components for education, professional development, and innovation. Um, we're national, we're connecting uh, us in that work community. We have mentorship programs. Um, we also have, you know, very broad coalitions, loose collective of Filipino employee, uh, Filipino American, I'm sorry, to be correct, Filipino ex American uh, employee resource groups. Um, they are just growing in number. I can't even keep track. We're always growing faster, no pun intended, um, than I can keep track of. So if you're a professional in tech and you are hiring, um, the one thing I'll have Aldrin do is um, post our job board in the chat. We are still trying to figure out how to build our job board as a redesign of our website to integrate APIs for anyone um, that have companies who are hiring um, folks, especially with a lot of um, the pandemic, a lot of our community has been displaced at multiple companies. And then for folks who, sorry, pardon my, my dog Pikachu, she's crying, so be quiet, okay? Um, so we also have an entrepreneurship component um, for every, you know, Bobby Murphy, who's a co-founder and CTO of Snapchat. Uh, we have lots of other uh, aspiring Filipino American tech entrepreneurs, uh, like many of the folks who are on this call, many of us are all creative and, um, and technology are, are innovators and we wanna to continue to support that even though there, we are so few in number. Um, if you wanna join faster, um, Aldrin will post the link into the chat. Um, 
And lastly, so me diving into the remarks on, on COVID-19. So I actually talked with Tim a lot about this. Um, and what I know is on the national level for Filipino American uh, national nonprofit groups, many don't have technical or scientific background or experience. So when they're looking at trying to figure out like how vaccine distribution is going to work, how people are impacted in, in so many different ways outside of um, folks who are undocumented. The one thing I will mention is, um, although the center at UC Davis, the Bullet Sun Center, is, I think had only about a million dollars in funding, they put out a mental health survey at one point. Uh, and while the population in California is at, I forget, like one or two million Filipinos, they had about only 800 respondents. And I thought, well, I don't know that they know how to use Google ads or Facebook ads or have a strategy on collecting a lot of this data. So there is um, a great need in our community, not only to have accurate data, that's why a lot of the work that uh, Lizelle's put together with uh, PhilPro is so important, but we really wanna be that sort of unique voice um, for folks who are uh, self-identified Philippine X Americans as science, as um, technologists, but they're in engineering, design, et cetera, if you're in this industry, um, there's always ways to contribute. Um, my focus primarily is on data science. Um, I talk a lot about AR, VR, and AI, augmented virtual reality and AI. Um, there's a lot of people booming in that community. They're are actually creating a lot of uh, really interesting data visualizations in AR and VR. Uh, currently, um, I haven't announced it yet, but I should be teaching next year. Um, it is related to data science, and so that is TBA. Um, if you want to check, I did put this in the chat earlier. We have a resource guide. It was very uh, brief, you know, things thrown together um, between national Asian American Pacific Islander, um, AAPI, and Filipino American groups. Um, I was just texting my good friend Ruby Barra today. She is um, a scientist by day at Thermo Fisher Scientific and by night is an MC. There's a great uh, article that talks about her work. Uh, she's actually working on vaccine development and test kits um, and has like new announcements coming soon. Um, she had worked with our um, past board member, Evelyn Obama, who founded Filipinos at Pinterest, who's also a filmmaker uh, on a new documentary that just released. Uh, so please check that out. Um, in terms of the last few things we support, uh, I know that folks had mentioned um, Kim. Kimberly actually mentioned the restaurants uh, that you know had shut down in her area. Um, Filipinos Feed the Front Lines um, is a big partner for us. So um, the folks who brought you Undiscovered, the Filipino Night Market in San Francisco, um, a lot of those folks, so Gina Mark Rosales um, and Desi Daganan, who is a part of um, that collective, they had also um, been very active at Soma Filipinas, the South of Market, a historic Filipino district in San Francisco. Go. Um, they've taken it upon themselves to build up a lot of the small business entrepreneur uh, community, a lot of food vendors, independent businesses. Um, so if Aldrin, I'm going to actually try to get the link in the chat and I'll put, repost this on Facebook, um, not only to donate to, to their campaigns, but uh, I do want to mention that outside of um, Pastor's Tech Committee and Aldrin, who'd been our uh, tech committee coacher and supporting getting involved, uh, had been supporting uh, Kristen Briantes, who's actually uh, me, uh, my classmate with Gina, who's um, one of the uh, founders of Pinayistas, uh, is actively working on uh, the Filipino night market and small business entrepreneurship. She'll be presenting on Sunday morning um, for small business entrepreneurship. Uh, she and Kristen and I are in the same class at UC Berkeley at Cal, so we're all a part of um, the Philippine X community. So when there was Filipino cultural nights, uh, that's how I met Gina, and this is you know amazing uh, alumni. But most folks don't know Kristen Briantes is also a uh, design uh, venture partner at Google Ventures previously before working at Stripe. She also owns the shop Sarup Shop. Uh, one of the other people I didn't mention here, I'd actually asked him initially uh, to host an event for us for our entrepreneurship component. Uh, Jim Harvey C, who's an investor at NASDAQ, also had invested in Twitter's um, other Filipino restaurant, uh, Manila Bowl, where we had founded Faster Pros. Um, the person we were working at the time, uh, Carlos, uh, founded Filipinos at Twitter. Uh, a lot of these businesses are dying, so it's really important for us uh, to support their cause. What they're doing is actually uh, taking the Filipino food and then delivering it to essential workers uh, throughout the Bay Area. So they've scaled not only from San Francisco Bay Area, but to Los Angeles and I think New York. And knowing, you know, folks like Kimberly talk about this, uh, it is such a great and amazing cause. So I encourage folks uh, to check out the website and donate. Um, Aldrin's been doing a great job to support their tech ops in, in different areas that um, they're less tech savvy in. Um, and the last few plugs, uh, there are a number of 
Philippine X American owned uh, businesses. Ruby had a couple that she had plugged on her Instagram, one of which designed her dress for the Grammys. So uh, you can check out uh, that mask there, Vincent Gallery. My favorite one is uh, the one by Annalisa from Filipina Exico. Um, they're donating 50% of their proceeds uh, to frontline workers. Um, I had been a legislative a strategy advisor for the Mask for All campaign. Um, my professor at USF and the University of San Francisco, where I did more of my training in deep learning, which is a branch of machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, is one of the world renowned experts as some of the first folks uh, really working on AI uh, and medical at, at that intersection. Uh, he had written a, a good number of posts on uh, COVID-19 with regard to masks. It's not just something being Asian American where we grow up knowing about you know, SARS or the avian flu and things of that nature. If you're in Asia, you wear a mask. Um, you know, there is actual data of other countries, such as the Czech Republic, that have that. So um, I do have a couple of links here. Um, I think Aldra can probably paste some of these into the chat because I know this is on the deck um, that I do want folks to take a look at. So the last thing I just want to do uh, is plug. Um, this is like a dated deck, so not register to vote. That deadline, I think, is now going to be over. So please remind yourselves to vote. Uh, go to the polls. There is also vote by mail. There are a lot of issues with that um, throughout the country. So if you need to check on a source that is reliable, our community partner on the national level is a long-standing nonpartisan nonprofit, uh, API vote. So check them out. Um, they've been serving the Asian American and Pacific Islander community uh, for quite some time. And I think that's it. I'll end it there. We do have other community partners. Uh, I did see Regina on the line on Facebook from uh, YFPA, your Filipino professional association here in the Bay area um, joining in on this call. Uh, I know Kimberly is also a member of NAP. There's a lot of folks in NAP that I know, actually know Mayor Justin Manalo through that organization uh, and Collective Hustle. So for the youth that are on the line and young professionals, um, we consistently partner with them. We'll continue to build uh, and organize together. I'm going to end it there. I think that's pretty much it. Um, the very last thing is a uh, it's our social media site. Everyone asked me, like, are, are faster websites being redesigned? There was just so much going on during COVID. It was hard to get everything up. We're still continuing working on it. In the meantime, um, you can find us on Facebook. We have a group, um, a fan page. We're on LinkedIn. If you don't like Facebook, we're on YouTube. Um, for anyone that does not like YouTube, I have not created a Vimeo page. Uh, there's our website. Please subscribe to our email list and you can contact us if you have any other questions. And so now I know we are super over time, but if there are any questions in either the chat or on Facebook, we'll take them for our great experts here that are on our last panel today. So either Jennifer Charity uh, or myself, we're more than happy to answer. Otherwise, I can close it. So we're just going to source that right now. If there are any questions, um, let me see really quick. I'm going to stop share. Uh, Monica T asked about Carnegie Mellon. Yes, we definitely have programs. A charity who's on our board is um, one of the folks who is, I guess, now the exiting president of Cal Filipino American Alumni Chapter. She's our liaison to Collective Hustle, and we get lots of college students. And um, Collective Hustle is national. It's not just here in the Bay Area. When we had founded our mentorship program initially, when I started it, before we partnered with Collective Hustle, and before um, Collective Hustle and the Filipino Channel uh, University TFCU formally, uh, we had mentored, I think, 50 students a year between Stanford and Berkeley primarily, and then wanted to open that up. So. Um, it is welcome. Uh, the one thing I'll mention is that it's STEAM and not STEM. Uh, at least with this program, we are the one um, sort of industry that sources mentors from the tech industry. We do include folks who are not engineers and that are not scientists, but are in the arts. That's actually a really important part of our community. We're actually some of the top leaders and designers and design thinkers in the community. So I want to just emphasize STEAM, not STEM. Uh, faster is called faster, not faster STEAM. But I put that there because when we rebranded our organization, which primarily first served as a um, the Bay Area's like sort of contingent uh, or, or initial chapters, Filipino Americans and Silicon Valley tech. I didn't want it to scale the way that I had seen and helped with Filipinos for Obama scaling at 13 cities. And I was like, oh, that's a lot of responsibility. We just want to take care of folks here. Um, you know, we ended up rebranding. We have chapters in New York and Los Angeles. I think Seattle and Chicago are starting. So yeah, we're more than welcome, Monica, to have your uh, daughter be a part of, um, you know, Collective Hustle's mentorship program with us at Faster. And uh, in addition to that program, we're still in talks with the nonprofits like the Mentoring Club um, and then figuring out with Salesforce CRM and uh, things of that nature of like an internship program where we're really focusing on not just, you know, group mentorship and webinars, but also um, really looking at one-on-one um, -on -one mentorship and then project-based uh, sort of learning that more on the professional end. 
sorry, pardon my dog. Um, Charity, do you want to source if there's any other questions in the chat or you want to add on anything there? No, I think that is pretty much it. I don't think I see any questions in chat. I'm going to scroll one more time just to do a quick share because we did get a, a quite a bit of reach on Facebook. All right, well, I think that is it. Unless there's anything else, I'm gonna close um, this amazing event out. Thank you everyone um, for your generous time, our esteemed panelists and speakers, Lizelle, Charity, Kimberly, Julian, Arnbien, Romer, Jennifer, Yobi, and the Honorable Jessen Manalo. Thank you so much. Um, we will be posting this on YouTube, but it will cut out Romer's um, video. So just FYI, you don't need to share uh, greatly on Facebook. I think some people shared it and I was trying to figure out editing the public button. But if you do want to uh, have more people view this, I would encourage you to invite them to join faster. We do have a membership form that I I think Aldrin dropped into the chat earlier. Um, so we just require that so that, you know, we one filter for spam bots and then also to really collect uh, accurate data on our community so we understand the community's needs. You know, there's a lot of us that are in tech, we're still very much an underrepresented group. And in order to grow that, we need to collect more of, um, this sort of information on our community. We're not sharing this data with anyone else, so it'll be HIPAA and privacy compliant. Um, but we also have tons of other folks who are not in tech that do wanna work with us and, and our broad community partners. So we still encourage folks um, to do that if they wanna join our community. It is self-identified primarily for Latinx Americans. In terms of allies, I feel a lot of people have been trying to join us, but you know we're still figuring out a lot of our social media sort of moderation. We have 12, I think 10, to 12 different channels right now between Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, uh, I think Slack and then Discord for a lot of our Filipino gamers. So with that being said, uh, oh, there was one more question. Monica's asked, how do we access the chat after you close the Zoom call? I can't remember if I had uh, saved the transcript. So before I end this, I'll, I'll paste some of it if, if folks need some of the links, uh, just because I think the slides, um, if roamers aren't there, I think we can actually post um, the slides in a bit.ly link that I could send out to all of our um, attendees. The easiest thing that you can do to get any access to this, Monica, is subscribe to our email listserv, um, which I did put in to the slide earlier. I'll put that up again. Um, and before, I know folks, if they need to go, they can do so. But I'll just leave this up for the next minute in case uh, people want uh, to find us. Uh, so if you subscribe to our email list, I, I primarily go there for our main announcements. Um, you know, I, we're not trying to spam people, but on a regular basis, if you want to stay connected, you can join our Facebook group. That's mainly where I post outside of Instagram uh, and LinkedIn. And I think that's pretty much it. Anyways, thank you all for uh, your amazing insight and uh, time and sharing your experiences and expertise today. For anyone else that wants to join faster, um, you can find us faster-team.org. Uh, I'll have Aldrin post our, our join links uh, there as well, because I know there's a ton of them that I have in this deck that we haven't all put out there. Um, yes, Aldrin will work on making our Notion website much more accessible until our new website is up, because we're still in the development process and eventually trying to come up with a, a mobile app and you know sort of a virtual community login and job board. So there's a lot in the pipeline um, through next year. We weren't able to get everything done before the conference, but um, if you do want to register for a conference, uh, check out the Notion link that um, Aldrin had in the chat. Uh, we have two more days of events. So tomorrow is a uh, Tech and Arts Day. So I'll actually, I should just share that uh, on our Facebook group because you know I think a lot of people are wondering like, what, what is this event? Is there a Facebook event? So I'll just pull that up. Um, and if folks, uh, any of the panelists need to leave, they can. I'll, I'll just put this up there just in case um, people wanted access because uh, we actually have, quite a few events uh, this year. Um, let me just see. So we have two more. So Tech and Arts Day is tomorrow on Facebook. We have a registration Zoom link. I think most people are here in fa our Facebook group already have it. So I'll, I'll post this into the chat so people have it. And oh, this is one thing that's a little bit funky. Bobby, yes, Roy Rubio will be speaking tomorrow, who is a director at Pixar. Um, and then we also have 
uh, I want to say, oh, this is not based on, I actually should just pull this from our bit.ly, which I'll get in a second so that people actually have the direct Zoom link. So uh, we have Facebook, Netflix, Riot Games, Electronic Arts. Um, we have Balai Creative. So a lot of the independent artists um, in our community that are also uh, speaking as well. Oh, why is this not working? Actually, you know what? I just remember off the top of my head. So I'm just going to type this in here. FazerCon 20 art. So if folks want to see the schedule, there we have it. So that is our line, amazing lineup this week. Uh, Artis Rabang will be um, co-modern who's at Lucasfilm under Georgia Lucas for I think over 15 years. Um, Jamie, who's on our board is uh, designing systems at Airbnb is also speaking as well. Uh, and then we have our two other tracks that are simultaneous for education. So for anyone else that is a P9 engineer, we have four amazing uh, Philippinex American engineers. We have assistant professor Gina Martinez at Lewis University in the Department of Computer Science, uh, Luzanne Bataun, who actually works at Amazon and specifically on Alexa. Uh, we have a best-selling author, Adrian Tack, uh, who wrote the book Coding for Kids Python. She actually works on C Sharp um, for MongoDB. Uh, Diana Navarro, who was a part of the very first cohort at Girls Who Code, is now a software engineer at Tumblr. And then our last few things, um, Christiana Bodge be facilitating our Filipino, our, sorry, our Faster Pros uh, breakout. She founded Filipinos at uh, Twilio. Aldrin says to take my time, but this is like so long. Um, I don't, I never, I get camera shy, even though I, I do stream and stuff, but I, I want to get through this because I know that there's a lot here. Uh, I'm going to pull up one last link for Faster Fresh because I think some people had issues actually registering uh, for, this is a new platform that is not Zoom. To run the world. Let me see. I can actually pull up the link really quickly. Faster Con 20 Fresh. Um, let's see if this actually works. I think when I was logged in when I did this, but you know what? It's a little bit funky. So I'll just actually pull up our flyers because we have so many. We actually didn't have time to put it into the deck because I, I think we've been working on, I don't know, four or five decks for Faster. So I'm just going to quickly share um more about this for for people that want to see because i know that we did post a lot on social media i've actually spent more time posting on external groups outside of faster to really grow it um so our education uh sort of panel these are the four amazing women that we have tomorrow charity will be uh facilitating this group along with our uh partner uh pasai uc berkeley's uh, undergraduate student organization filipino Asso association of architects scientists and engineers uh and then our last ones we have oh yeah so faster fresh so let me actually go back one more so faster fresh so it's embarrassing for me to be like our, our site isn't up but totally fine. There's just so much going on during COVID. It's amazing that we managed to pull together uh, this many events. So we do have a number of uh, investors. So we have two advisors, Kendrick Co uh, from Global Founders Capital, um, also Ken Daniel So uh, from Shasta Ventures um, that are both based here in the Bay Area. And then Mark Linnell from AET, Akatsuki Entertainment um, Fund out of Los Angeles. Um, and then for our founders, uh, we have, uh, not Janelle, so this is incorrect, I think that's an old flyer, so we actually had Rajiv Iyengar, who is the co-founder co and CEO of Tandem Chat, so he is busy scaling his company, um, like I think he 15 x his company, their collaborative platform before COVID-19 was uh, killing Zoom, uh, and then we also have, um, let me see, so Brian, uh, so Brian and Rajiv were both a part of Y Combinators, um, which is one of the premier uh, accelerator programs in the world. They create a lot of um, billion dollar companies such as Dropbox, Uber, Airbnb. Uh, so he had co-founded another company called Yardbook. Uh, so had actually, I think, founded two different um, you know, companies and is now at Facebook, uh, leading business development in Facebook, uh, AI, particularly so on uh, artificial intelligence. And I think our last person, so I think it was incorrect on this uh, flyer, they do want to mention um, Amy Leanne Gaspar Santos has a privacy company uh, that she had founded. So um, it's called Lion X. So check us out tomorrow. I'm just helping. I'm not actually talking too much about my company. And I would say that um, 
Julian knows this just because uh, we've been trying to figure out how to work on, um, at least for me, uh, vaccine development and, and helping uh, anyone in R&D efforts for uh, COVID. And for me personally, my biggest passion right now is still augmented and virtual reality. I've been working on um, advancing uh, primarily um, degenerative neurodegenerative brain disease, so Alzheimer's research. And at the time, people told me it was really hard to do. <laughs> I was like, I don't care if I'm still going to do it. Um, and it's really hard to do with VR. There's actually quite a few companies that work on the clinical side for VR. Um, I was focused on DNA molecular visualization and protein binding. So a lot of that work, especially with um, Google's uh, big acquisition, DeepMind, uh, which is their big artificial intelligence company, I was trying to figure out how to replicate what they were doing, <laughs> except, you know, focused on um, Alzheimer's. Now I've pivoted the company to really focus on COVID-19 research, but there's just a plethora of, um, I think between myself and, and Julius looking at, sorry, Julian, looking at all of these different um, medical journals, it is overwhelming. So we're still in talks with a lot of um, HPC, so high performance computing, um, academic research institutions and clients, as well as different biotech companies really understanding uh, their needs because there's a lot of three-dimensional data. I'm not talking about a lot of the clinical or epidemiological data that's been talked here today. I'm talking about things at the molecular level that if there are so many simulations a supercomputer um, can run, there's a lot that's still missing. And part of that reason is because uh, I think a lot of research, even the Alzheimer's committee, there's 3D data that you can't see on a 2D screen that you can actually access better with a virtual reality headset instead of controllers or your hands now with haptics in VR. So there's a lot um, there that we're still developing. I've been trying to patent more on the data engineering pipeline. I didn't show any of my slides there just because a lot of that is still stealth and IP of things I need to patent before <laughs> I can share it. But uh, that's just my last plug there is, you know, Vaster's really here to support and facilitate um, these sort of like connections with the community to share a lot of our work. I think the other slides I skipped over was that I have a book on augmented and virtual reality. And part of the reason I show that to people is because, you know, I never thought, I think, probably 10 years ago when I graduated and I was still campaigning for Obama, that this would be a career that I would choose. I knew I would eventually go back into tech, but I did not, I couldn't have predicted that I'd be working on COVID-19, obviously. Um, but before that, I wouldn't have predicted I'd be working on augmented reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence. And I think throughout my career before, and I think this is after graduating from UC Berkeley, I was trying to figure out this thing called data science. And so confidentially, I haven't announced it yet, but now I'm in talks with UC Berkeley School of Information in their master's in data science program to actually teach um, primarily in their capstone program where it's sort of like their mini dissertation. So it's very odd to be thinking, I'm trying to figure out this field, I write a book and now I'm teaching about it. That was not something I knew when I was five years old I would do. I just thought my parents are in startups and biotech talking about their startup equity when I'm seven. And I had no idea what that would mean for me. And I don't think that's the case for a lot of our community. I grew up very privileged with my parents both working in biotech for 30 years. Uh, I didn't show the slides today, but I'll, I'll be sharing more tomorrow about um, my sort of journey and path with computational creativity, looking at the intersection of science, technology, engineering, arts and math, which were all encouraged in my family in different ways, but that's not the case for a lot of our community. We're still very much are underrepresented and in tech. And so that's one of the reasons why Faster exists. Um, anyways, thank you so much for taking time. I didn't know the panelists were all still here. I thought I was still talking to like, I don't know, the five other people who are on here. You're still on here. So thank you so much for your time. Please, please, please do register for the conference. Um, we want to see all of your beautiful faces there. And I know it's FAM, uh, Philippine X American History Month. If you cannot make it, we will be posting most of the sessions on YouTube. Not everything will be. The caucus time for entrepreneurs and professionals will be private. So that is closed to press just because we got, actually have. The last thing I'll mention is today, we have a Chicago journalist whose husband is a biologist, but she's writing an, an encyclopedia entry on Filipinos in, she said, STEM, and I tried to get her to say STEAM. Um, so she's interviewing me talking about FASTER, so we will now be in encyclopedias. Um, and I had mentioned to her, we are actually working on a book uh, for FASTER. This is more long-term into the future where um, the pioneer, uh, Dado Bonatau, who, if you know him, he owns the IP to every trip in your cell phone. He was in Homebrew Computer Club with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, serial entrepreneur and has also founded Phil Dev Foundation. I had asked him years ago if he could be a part of the book. He had said yes, uh, as well as DJ Kubert. So for all the young millennials that are on the call, um, DJ Kubert owns a lot of the patents to music IP from everything from the DJ turntable with your laptop to the AI. I think that it's partnered 
at the time with Intel to the breakbeat on b-boying competitions that are kind of like the Olympics of b-boying and there's like an actual scientific way to measure you know like why a breakbeat of a dancer to like a musical beat right like that's his whole IP so uh, DJ Qbert is, is amazing and so there's actually a lot of intersections with um, uh, arts, music, and technology that um, we're recognizing as well. If you are interested in being part of the book, you can contact us. I think I have that in our slides that we'll make public. And I'm going to end there because uh, we are definitely super over time. I actually initially didn't want this to be slated at three hours to avoid this, but it was unavoidable. I'm just so glad that there are still folks here that are on uh, with us. We'll see you promptly tomorrow. Again, it's, this is going to be 930. So a lot of the remarks I didn't mention there, I'll be giving tomorrow morning. Um, and then we'll have Bobby Rubio um, story on um, artist and director at Pixar at 10 o'clock. Um, the panels will run until 1230. We break for lunch and then we'll have breakouts at two to four. So that's tomorrow's agenda. And then we'll also release um, the more specific fresh agenda for fre faster fresh entrepreneurship on Sunday. And with that being said, thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to end this webinar after I paste the chat. So sorry, that was like a lot. There was no way I was going to cut that down. I, I tried really hard. I know everyone else who had lectured like Romer for 20 minutes. It was too hard to, to cut you off because there was just too much great material that I wish everyone in our community can, can listen to it and hear and, and watch. And so um, this is not the last time we'll be having this. The last thing I will say um, is that, and this is what I've said in our arts preparation calls, there's a lot of strategy that needs to be involved for vaccine development. Uh, my parents had me writing articles on the Philippine Pathology Center when I was 18 publishing it in Philippine news and mailing it to Dada Bonital. I didn't mention that before, but to other wealthy Filipino investors to donate um, to those uh, R&D uh, facilities in the Philippines. And I thought it was the most boring thing on the planet. I was like, SARS and Asian flu doesn't affect me. Why are you making me write this? I just want to write about hip hop and maybe politics and other cool stuff I care about. It was like the first this thing from my mind. Now I realized it was probably one of the most important things um, that my parents instilled in me and having my mom actually found, um, she was one of the two Filipina um, licensed veterinarians and was president of the Filipino American, um, was it Northern California Association of Filipino Veterinarians. And so I think with that and seeing all of the organizing she had done for Filipino Americans at biotech, I looked at folks like Romer uh, and Jennifer and I really see you know, my parents as well. They both were at UP Dilemon and they were organizing the UP alumni associations you know, for their community. And so I wanted to take on that and to continue that. And so you know, this is not uh, for faster a one-time event or a one-time thing we're still going to continue to organize you know our scientists uh our engineers our designers both in their respective industries and fields and on COVID-19 we're going to be that voice and so um we will continue to have this conversation uh offline um but yes I'm going to now officially convene I keep saying goodbye but I never say goodbye so now goodbye everyone and we'll see you tomorrow thank you so much okay bye-bye thank you bye great job everyone Bye. Thank you. Bye. And I'm going to end this. I'm just pasting this very long chat on my laptop.